Okay, so we are about to begin. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, distinguished discussants, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to you all, to all participants. It is really a great honor and pleasure for me to be the moderator of this important roundtable around the ambitious topic of social capital and social responsibility. We really look forward for your insightful thoughts that will guide the willings towards cooperation and collective action towards achieving the SDG number one, which is ending poverty in all its forms everywhere. So we, um, regarding poverty in the decade between 2002 and 2012, the proportion of the global population living below poverty, the poverty line dropped by half from 26% to 13%. Could then convergent efforts from states, corporates, individuals achieve the expected results to better the current international poverty line, which is around the $190 US dollars per person and per day. If uh, all around the world, we feel if all will con uh, feel concerned and willing to do something about and providing that the global economy growth currently forecast to be healthy will continue at a sustained pace, how possible and probable will be to achieve SDG, what SDG 1 expects, which is redu further reduce the global rate for extreme poverty to 4% by 2030. So before we get to the core of our today's debate, I would like to welcome and Daniela Bass, Ms. Daniela Bass, who is the director of the United Nations Division for Social Policy and Development in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. She is really, she's a political scientist. She has a long, long experience in international politics, and uh, she has a major, actually, in international politics. Uh, she mm. graduated from Magna Cum Laude. She worked for the United Nations, uh, first between uh, 1986 and 1995, and uh, she has managed the roles, uh, uh, managerial roles, um, in, uh, from 1996 and 2011 in the private sector in Italy in, in different uh, positions, very high level positions. Um, she has been working with the presidency of the Council of Ministers of Human Rights and Social Affairs. She has been a member of the Board of, direct, of Directors of the European Union Agency of Fundamental Rights and so on. Daniela, we really look forward for your insight, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, well, well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, but above all, excellencies, uh, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me, Sifa, though we have been collaborating together, but uh, yet you trusted that I could add uh, some value to this uh, very important event. I hope I will be able to do so. <clears throat> Indeed, for the various stakeholders that are um, expressing their views uh, in the space given by the United Nations, uh, for all these stakeholders to approach issues so relevant to the world, such as issues related to financing, and since we deal with, uh, in, in the division I lead, with the social dimension of sustainable development, for instance, financial inclusion for us is very important. So financing on one hand, the private sector on the other hand, the public sector on the end, but for whom? For the people and the planet. So I, I find that this, the topic that CIFA has chosen this year, building private sector trust and resilient societies to eradicate poverty. Now, trust. Who needs trust? Well, trust is needed by the people. Who are the people? Those who 
you know, we have uh, asked to, to provide us governance, good governance. So to do that, they need uh, the policymakers, in this case, the trust of the communities uh, they are trying to serve at their best. And on the other hand, and on the other hand there is the trust that people have to give to those who are providing us and try to fulfill our needs. The private sector listens to what the needs are and provides goods and services to fulfill those needs. And so economy and finance play an important role in this. At the same time, other needs are expressed by the population to those, to the policymakers and to the uh, public institutions. So here it is where we have the space to have a dialogue and see how building the private sector trust and resilient societies can help to eradicate poverty. This is more or less, I suppose, what we were trying to do today. Public and private sectors on social capital and social responsibilities are key also for the policy theme that the Commission for Social Development that is happening these days has chosen strategies to eradicate poverty. So there are many multi-dimensions of poverty. I believe today we're going to tackle a few of those. As you know, uh, the Commission for Social Development um, has as main mandate the one derived from Copenhagen in 1995 on ways to promote um, social development. And the core issues are eradication of poverty, work and decent jobs, social inclusion and integration, and reducing the gap of inequalities, in our case, of social inequalities. And, 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 and therefore, if you think of what are now uh, the key areas of the new agenda that governments have decided to design, uh, composed by 19 go 17 goals to be reached in the next 13 years, poverty, again, is a key element. Poverty is a challenge that is faced by least developed countries, middle uh, uh, income countries, and developed countries. It's universal. It can be divided differently depending the, the, in the country where we are. And poverty is not only um, to be looked in terms of vertical, rich, poor, but poverty is also horizontal. And in all these different kinds of multifacets of poverty, besides talking about money, we have to talk about poverty in terms of lack of education. It impoverishes a community. Uh, la, you know, um, poor health, poor nutrition. So there are many kinds of aspects of poverty. And we have to make sure that we do not impoverish our culture. I'll go back to the key word culture in a moment. So as I said, with, the, with this new agenda, we see that the overarching theme is poverty, goal number one. And uh, it provides a vision, the new agenda, of a share the future with equality and opportunities for all. And it is pledged to leave no one behind. So if we think of... Um, of not leaving no one behind. So what kind of formulation of training policies that meet market needs do we need to think of and develop? And what kind of work experience and mentorship we need to give, for instance, to young people and not only? And how the facil facilitating, for instance, the access of youth to markets, capital and networks can improve the well-being of people and the planet. Promoting the well-being, it means that we build trust. If you build, because people feel well. Building trust, it means that if you feel well, the, the, the concept of security is there. And when people feel secure, they feel happy. Now, I would like to, 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 to highlight what works and what does not work. And what is therefore the importance of the private sector partnership? Why it is important? We do need the strategies 
and we need strategic alliances with the private sector that reflect the necessity for different types of partners that are working together to tackle social issues. So let's imagine the world. Be with me, imagine the world. Okay, it's there, that round thing where we live. In this world, the, the prim primary goal of the private sector for this world that we imagine is to align their internal business goals to support sustainable development and maximize the positive social outcome of their initiatives and their activities. So what is the potential of the private sector in this imaginary world that we have? Well, the private sector's economic growth and dynamism has an immediate potential to facilitate sustainable development in many ways. What? Well, the private sector has the potential to lift people out of poverty and income deprivation by creating jobs and improving human skills. That is why we have this discussion today, I believe, to turn the words of the SDG 1, poverty, Sustainable De Development Goal 1 of the 2030 Agenda, poverty, which aims to eradicate poverty into action and reality. How? Sustainable development is best served if the private sector positions itself to foster inclusive growth, to ensure that no one is left behind. Prejudice, investment, marginalization. Prejudice, the how. Prejudice is one of the main obstacles persons with disabilities are faced within when entering the job market. Widely adopted uh, uh, corporate social responsibility strategies, which aim to change negative stereotypes about persons with disabilities, provide a fertile ground to begin conversation about diversity and inclusion to promote well-being. Investment. Young people are another social group whose social well-being and economic needs must be considered. The private sector can play a significant role in promoting decent work for youth. They can participate in the formulation of training policies that meet market needs, as I said earlier on, provide work experience and mentorship, and facilitate the access of youth to markets, capital, and networks. Investing in young people can only result in a win-win situation where they feel well. Marginalization, older persons. Older persons also suffer from marginalization in the workplace. And one way we could leverage partnerships with the private sector is to encourage social policies that promote, guess what, the well-being of older persons in areas such as employment and health services. So call for action, I'm almost at the end. The United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, put it best when he said, global coherence demands a permanent strategic cooperation culture at all levels. Culture at all levels. We must enhance engagement with the civil society and the private sector, since there can be no poverty eradication without a generation of wealth we would further promote the UN Global Compact, highlighting the mutual benefits of corporate responsibility. The United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs and the division that I have to honor to lead within this department, the Division for Social Policy and Development, are ready to support and work closely with member states and all of those sitting around this table. And I do really look forward to hearing what you have to bring to the table in terms of social policies and best practices to build private sector trust and resilient societies to eradicate poverty, to promote resilience, and by exploring new frontiers of empowerment of people and the planet. 
by ensuring that people have the opportunities they need to live better lives in dignity and security. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. How much, uh, how much enthusiasm and positive drive you bring to your presentation. Thank you very much. We appreciate. Now I would like to introduce uh, Miss Essa Alatebi. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Thank you. She, she, we are very honored to, to have you here. Uh, she has a, a, a really solid, solid experience in uh, SDGs, uh, sustainable development, humanitarian assistance for aid to refugees and migrants. Those are really, those are really uh, topics uh, very important nowadays. Uh, she's, uh, she's a senior specialist in international economic organization and uh, working at the uh, Department of Economic Affairs of the United Arab Emirates Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. She was also a member of national, the National Committee for the Study of FTA and the negotiation with the Gulf Cooperation countries and other UAA uh, trade uh, partners. She has been also in different national, regional, and international level representing the United Arab Emirates position among the, um, the Gulf Cooperation uh, countries. Uh, you uh, have you have uh, um, you have uh, five minutes for your statement, okay. and we really I'm look forward to to, <laughs> to hearing what you, you have to bring to our discussion. Thank, thank you, you for Kazima. being here. Thank you for this introduction, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you all for being with us today, and I'm very pleased to be part in this event addressing the social capital and social responsibility, building the private sector, trust, and resilient societies to eradicate poverty. Uh, before I'm going to the point directly, and just like uh, uh, quote uh, Daniela when she said that poverty is universal, mm -hmm. it's actually a you know, horizontal thing. So uh, coming from like an oil producing country, is a rich country, we don't have that much of poverty as we can, you know, uh, like trying to help others uh, like beyond the UAE, beyond the region, and eradicate the poverty. So I'll tell you how through our uh, private sector. So going back uh, to the point or to the, our presentation or our event, so achieving the ambitious goals to, of sustainable development as SDGs, including eradicating poverty, improving the global health, ensuring education for all, and mitigating climate change by 2030 will cost a lot of money. The total amount will go far beyond what governments can provide, and the gap cannot be closed by ODA, Official Development Assistance, the contribution of the private sector as well as the financial markets will therefore be necessary. So here it comes to the concept of, of social responsibility is a result of requirements of sustainable development and partnership in economic development between the state and the private sector to build a better future for future generation in order to finance, support, sustainable social, economic, and cultural program derived from, derived from the national needs and priorities. This concept is based on investment in human resources and promoting sustainable economic growth by developing public-private sector partnership and providing employment opportunities for young people, mm -hmm. people of determination. This actually, our names for people who are a person with disabilities, actually it's, a, it's done by our government. We no longer say persons with disabilities, but we say people of determination. So I'm going to the all, you know, all my time saying people of determination and you know who's the people of determination and empowering them in the process of your community building. Until recently, international organization and government had, rel had relatively clear roles in the global development agenda and sustainability, while private sector participation was often seen through the lens of contribution to economic growth, job creation, and tax revenues. This, pers this perspective must change now with the private sector assuming a broader and more integrated role in the development agenda, and the private sector can become financer with billions of dollars of capital transferred to developing economies. It can play an important role as an, an outlet, translating profits into sustained gro economic growth, social integration, and protection of the environment. So how that come? Our, our, how it 
implement. So I will not go far from my country, the United Arab Emirates, who showcased the successful example in partnership between the government and the private sector and civil society for the social responsibility and social integration. As you know, the UAE is rapidly becoming a global center for trade, industry, innovation, mm -hmm. thanks to our advanced infrastructure, rapid technological development, and modern laws and policies. As a, a result, a growing number of entrepreneurs and experts from the Middle East and the rest of the world come to the UAE to establish their own businesses and in, in, this, uh, in this appropriate environment achieve growth and prosperity. Therefore, the UAE is an ideal destination to discuss sustainable develop, development in its three dimensions, showing the ability to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs in the framework of providing good opportunities for young people and to optimize their energies. Firstly, as you know, we have a ministry called the Ministry of Social Development, led by a woman. One of their agenda is working to reinforce the partnership and cooperation between both the public sector and private sector, consolidate the culture of social responsibility in accordance with our national agenda, UAE 2021. Secondly, most of our private sector are active member in the UN Global Compact, the world's largest sustainability initiative. This global network in the UAE is growing rapidly, rapidly uh, reflecting the interest of major players in the region to play an, an active role in improving our current world, bringing business leaders from the region and the world together with the civil society, the UN NGOs, investors, and academia to discuss the actual steps and required partnership to develop sustainable development in UAE and beyond. Here I can give you two examples with a successful partnership between the government and the private sector in my country. Do. Do actually is a telecommunication company. It's one of the leading telecommunication company. I'm sure anyone who comes to UAE knows about Etisalat and Do. So this company has a strength in its support for people of determination. I mean special needs people by introducing Bab Noor. So Bab Noor is an Arabic uh, translation of the gate of light. This is the first Arabic language cloud application designed to effectively connect with autistic children and have problem communicating with others. And with, uh, in terms of, this is like for, for the people uh, of determination and for supporting the local communities. As you know, like in my country, uh, there is some remote areas from the capital which, uh, which have like local communities. Those local communities, especially women, needs to empower them. So uh, this, uh, they, do, they did uh, an initiative to establish a customer service center. So it's a unique example of com a company contribution to this area. So most, mo most of, I mean like more than of, more than 90% of the employees there are actually women, women with like, uh, uh, like less education, but they have a kind of another source of income. So uh, mm -hmm. instead of uh, asking for the government loans or government mm -hmm. assistance, they have their own job, like a uh, good job, so they can uh, empower themselves and doing their business, uh, having a life in this, from this job. The second uh, initiative, like we have something called Sanduq al-Watan, which means in Arabic, uh, in English, the nation fund. So maybe some of them uh, say this is a government or public uh, fund. No, it's a private sector fund. So this is a group of Emirati businessmen launched this initiative as a community initiative that reflects the cohesion of the community with orientation of the state leadership in achieving sustainable development, a decent life, and a bright future for all citizens of the country. It aims at realizing national priorities and enhancing the prospect for sustainable development by consolidating the concept of the social integration and social responsibility in their initiative, like encouraging women, youth, and the people of determination for their uh, entrepreneurship projects. Mm -hmm. That's all, and thank you everyone for your attention. Mm -hmm. I think I uh, got it for five minutes, right? Very good, excellent. Because you're Thanks. running a little bit late. Thank you very much and, uh, for your insightful comments. And uh, it's always uh, so encouraging to witness that uh, uh, yes, our, your country uh, is so firmly committed to this cause. Uh, the world must unite in, uh, mm -hmm. in this effort, in my opinion, in order to achieve the ex expected results. So now I would like to introduce our five panelists uh, briefly, and uh, each one of them will have uh, um, ten minutes for personal for a personal statement, and uh, and uh, they um, they are prepared the statement. Uh, we have first we have um, 
uh, I, I will just introduce them and I will give the, the uh, first we will have uh, Louise Cantrell. Um, she has, uh, she, she, uh, since she does not have too much time, uh, she will be speaking first. Uh, Louise Cantrell is a, a former ambassador of the International Chamber of Commerce and a permanent representative in, uh, in uh, New York. She has a long, long experience. She has been really dealing with uh, so many countries. The ICC works with 130 countries. She has organized, uh, she was involved in multiple uh, major UN conferences uh, mm -hmm. as ICC and, uh, the pri uh, and also as a private sector representative. Uh, Dr. Cantor coordinated business and industry contribution to political processes representing and delivered business sector messages and organized officially UN business sector events. She has been especially, um, uh, she, she uh, led the establishment and the coordination of the Global Business Alliance for 2030, uh, for the 23rd agenda. Um, Dr. Cantor career has been, uh, uh, in, uh, has included uh, uh, several posts within uh, the UN uh, and senior position at non-profit, governmental, and intergovernmental organization. She has also worked uh, in the International League of the Human Rights. Louise, mic's yours, and you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Cosima. And I just want to um, start off by thanking uh, the organizers. It's really a pleasure for me to join so many of my colleagues on this really important session in the margins of the um, 56th session of the Commission for Social Development, which is focusing on strategies for eradicating poverty to achieve sustainable development for all. And again, I'm indebted to CIFA in terms of organizing this event on the, the very important topic of social capital and social responsibility, building private sector trust and resilient societies to eradicate poverty. And you know, if we think about it, as recently as five years ago, we could not have imagined that an organization like CIFA would have organized a session at a UN conference on sustainable development. We have really come a long way. And for me, as, the, uh, as an ambassador to the UN for, for the International Chamber of Commerce for the last 10 years, I was really privileged to hold this position as we transitioned from the MDGs to the SDGs. And this was a transformation not only for business, but for the UN and for civil society. How each of these sectors of society um, uh, worked together and got us to the point where we approved the 2030 agenda in, in September of 2030. And if you allow me, both of our introductory uh, remarks noted that extreme poverty has been reduced tremendously. In fact, it was the first MDG to be achieved, and it was achieved five years early, five, year, five years earlier than anticipated, which was a tremendous goal. And if we go backwards to 2000, when the MDGs were first launched, Business was not included at all, either in the elaboration of the MDGs, nor was it understood how business would contribute to the achievement. But it then again, fast forward uh, in 2015, and when there was a review of, of the achievements that, that were obtained, it became eminently clear that business had a very constructive role in raising people out of poverty, job creation, and technological advancement. So that when in 2012 in the, at the, the Rio Plus 20 conference, when the then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon launched his visioning for what would occur in the post-2015 era, he began to embrace the role of the private sector. And again, it was, it was a thrilling experience for us for we in the, in the business sector, I'm looking over at, at, at Angus and, and, and Jean-Pierre, for us to be involved in the elaboration and the negotiation of the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And essentially, when that, 
in that landscape from, from 2013 through, to, through 2015, it was really clear that the landscape for the elaboration of a 2030 agenda had changed. It's recognized that poverty now resolves mostly in middle-income countries and that official development assistance, while still very important, especially in the least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states, it is not, it is not the overwhelming flow of capital to developing countries. And in fact, it is private capital flowing to developing regions has far outpaced um, official ODA. So we really, we have really entered a new era in which there is competition for land, water, food, and energy. And the impacts of climate change, for example, are enormous. The challenges in designing the new agenda are going to be, were going to be huge. They were huge, but by 2015, we had in fact negotiated the 17 SDGs and business had a tremendous role to play. So what, what is important about that though is what I wanna go over in just the few minutes that, that, that I have remaining is that why is business eager to come to the table? Why does business want to be a constructive partner? And what is underpinning this whole thing and, and why, does, why does it resonate and where does the role of trust play? which is going to be critically important. Um, first of all, what was extremely gratifying for, for those in the business uh, community was that the, both the, the, the um, Addis Ababa Action Agenda plus the 2030 Agenda squarely recognized that these two agendas cannot be achieved without the active participation of business and the financial sector. And you will see that, that in his final years, uh, Ban Ki-moon and now Secretary General um, Antonio Gutierrez are focusing, laser focused, on the important role of the financing, the SDGs. And so uh, again, it's wonderful that we have CIFA here now to address the issues around, around the financing of this. Um, but what was, was even more gratifying was that the 2030 agenda specifically underscores that for the agendas to succeed, covering all the countries and all stages of development, it's going to be essential that businesses of all sizes grow and flourish in a responsible and sustainable manner. And if these businesses, working within all societies, create the decent jobs and livelihoods and provide the technical resources to create and deploy new solutions to the sustainable challenges facing the international community. This is what will be essential. So again, now I just wanna say, okay, why does, it, why does this agenda resonate with business? And there are a few reasons that I can, I can distill. And one is uh, that the SDGs are action oriented. They are what we call smart. They are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. This this, these aspects all resonate uh, for business. And that universality underpins all the SDGs. They provide an overriding vision to, errat to eradicate poverty with one integrated approach that reflect all three dimensions of sustainable development social inclusion, economic empowerment for all groups in society, and environmental stewardship. The SDGs recognize that the earth is finite and that resources must be respected and managed efficiently to ensure a net positive contribution over the long term while striving to significantly reduce the ne negative environmental impacts. Now, this next one, which relates to SDG 16, is one that both business and civil society really came together on, which was unique and which, you know, which again begins to be the underpinning for a wonderful partnership. The SDGs emphasize good governance, 
focused on smart regulation, rule of law, and well-functioning national institutions, most notably to reduce corruption and informality. This was something that business and, and civil society fought for to, to make sure that, that goal 16 was included. The SDGs support institutions to protect and promote human rights, gender equality, and the empowerment of women. Essentially, businesses cannot thrive in societies that don't thrive. And these are all important issues that, that, make, that give us some assurance that societies will thrive. And finally, the SDGs provide a roadmap on the means of implementation. Never before have we had such a roadmap. And so again, this is why business is eager to come to the United Nations and eager to present not only what they are trying to do to contribute it, but also to work closely with our colleagues in civil society, in uh, government. And I think that that is the only way we're, we're going to succeed. So thank you again for including me. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you for your contribution. Now let me introduce uh, Jean-Pierre Desran. She mentioned SIFA, uh, so I'll switch it to Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre has a long, long successful life and experience in finance. Uh, he is uh, the uh, co-founder and secretary general of the Convention of Independent Financial Advisors, a Swiss non-profit foundation and non-governmental organization in general consultative status with the Social and Economic Council of the United Nations. Jean-Pierre is the main representative of CIFA to the ECOSOC in New York. Uh, since 1976, uh, he has also um, been a founding partner and CEO of FIDURON, uh, a multi-family uh, office holding a security uh, dealer license regulated by the Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority, uh, FINMA, and uh, prior to 1976, uh, he has really uh, covered uh, several executive positions in, uh, in the financial business. Jean-Pierre, you have 10 minutes to. The floor is yours. Thank you, Cosima. And uh, thank you uh, to be here and uh, be able to uh, say a few words to this distinguished audience. Um, CIFA is something very special because we are small and medium enterprises, which have never been really represented at the United Nations. Large transnational corporations have always been interacting at this level, but small and medium enterprises who in the Western world in average represent 80% of the employment, uh, mostly with companies of 10 or less people, have never been able to express themselves because if you look generally at the Western world, these are the big job creators. And why are they the big job creators? Because they're led by entrepreneurs who take a risk. And the risk is to invest and to do something they believe in. Now, that idea of risk taking, that idea of entrepreneurship in has to be transferred to the emerging market world. And it is ultimately the only way to create the wells that will help and pull the poorest of the poorest uh, out of extreme poverty. But an entrepreneur will be stimulated by certain factors. First, opportunity. Too much regulation, for example, kills opportunities. Then the environment. The ideal environment is political stability, economic stability, and I would say the most important factor is the respect of the rule of law. Because companies and entrepreneurs cannot develop without a respect of the rule of law. Then everybody looks at the private sector and SMEs are the largest segment of the private sector. And you're following taxation, 
Now, excessive taxation is killing entrepreneurship, especially with SMEs, because SMEs have no possibility to optimize their tax situation. You know, we used to have that story of what is uh, the difference um, you know, what, what the difference between a school report and taxation. Uh, with the school report, if it's good, you get congratulated. With taxation, if you do good, you get punished. And that is something, especially in the Western world or in all emerging countries situations, you have to be very careful to keep the stimulation so that the entrepreneurs will naturally come out and create new jobs. Private sector trust. The word trust is extremely important, and that's why we have a magazine that is called Trusting. And we feel that trust is also one of those cornerstones of development. How can you develop an economy if you have a government you don't trust, if the situation is corrupt, where real competition cannot express itself. And these are segments that create, I would say, extreme poverty and have to be worked on by all governments and not the private sector because the private sector invests in an opportunistic way where their money will be safe. What is the first sign for an investor to go and enter a country? The first sign is that the domestic entrepreneurs do not pull their own money out of the country before, re instead of reinvesting it. Once a country has achieved the level of maintaining the major part of the money generated in their own country for reinvestment, suddenly you will see the exterior investors who will be interested in coming too. But again, for that, don't forget, and these are the three points that are absolutely important for any country that wants to develop harmoniously political stability, economic stability, and please, the respect of the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very, very clear, very insightful, <laughs> as always. Uh, now I would like to introduce um, uh, Judith, Ms. Judith Arena. Uh, Deputy Depart uh, Permanent Observer to the United Nations inter uh, in the International Development Law Organization. She, I'm really impressed with her uh, uh, resume once more. The, she, she has been, um, uh, really she implements uh, the external positioning of IDLO, um, advo advocacy, government relations, public affairs, uh, strategic communication efforts, everything to contribute to build a culture of justice. And this is important, uh, you know, just linking <coughs> what uh, Jean-Pierre just said. Prior to joining IDLO, she was a vice president at, at APCO Worldwide, uh, providing Fortune 500 companies, governments, and trade associations uh, with the strategic council and market entry, corporate social responsibility, and sustainability. She has also worked, uh, um, uh, she has a deal of experience in uh, women's empowerment. Uh, she has been also in, uh, in um, leading uh, major human rights campaigns in uh, several countries. And she has also focused on child protection uh, issues around the world, uh, gender and conflict and accountability to all corners over the world. I think she's really, she has an impressive resume. We look forward to listening from you. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cosima. Thank you very much for the, 
to the previous panelists that have really set up my remarks, and I hope I don't repeat a lot of what has already been said, but expand. we'll take the opportunity to expand on those points. So, Chair, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it really is a great pleasure for me personally to be here to speak on this issue that's actually very close to my heart because I have spent a very large part of my career either in civil society trying to persuade the private sector about their responsibility to respect human rights or in the private sector and consulting advising companies and trade associations about why it's important for the private sector to engage with the major development issues, not just because it should be part of their corporate social responsibility strategies, but because essentially it's good for business. It's also an honor for my organization, for the International Development Law Organization, which, like the ICC, has permanent observer status here at the UN, to contribute to these discussions on social capital and social responsibility, particularly as the Commission for Social Development discusses the really important issue about what are those strategies that we need to achieve to eradicate poverty, a critical issue that Daniela has already very helpfully laid out for us. Let me just take um, a few minutes to tell you a little bit about IDLO. IDLO is the only intergovernmental organization that has an exclusive mandate focused on the rule of law. And I'm very pleased to hear that my preceding speakers agree on the importance of the work that we undertake. It's a great pleasure for me to actually be here today because today marks the 30th anniversary of the moment when eight governments took the very important step to decide that the rule of law needed to be on the multilateral stage and that an organization outside the UN system needed to be set up exclusively to tackle this issue. And um, in preparing for some of our commemorations, I actually went back to our founding documents and was very interested to read that 30 years ago, as those eight governments got together in Italy and Rome, they decided that the, the reason why an organization like IDLO was needed was precisely because the law and the rule of law is critical for economic development, and somehow a mechanism needed to be found to help developing countries move forward in this area. So it really is a real pleasure to be addressing you on this special occasion for us today. The consensus is growing, and in fact, it's not growing, it's already well known, that the international community cannot eradicate poverty, promote sustainable development, or create inclusive economies when human rights are ignored, when the rule of law is absent, when justice and accountability systems do not function properly, when women and minorities suffer from discrimination, and when opportunities are open only to a few based on wealth and privilege. Where the rule of law is absent, business finds it hard to operate, and there are significant damaging commercial ramifications, such as lack of respect for intellectual property, poor means of contract enforcement and regulatory compliance, legal transparency and reliable mechanisms of arbitration. In essence, if the rule of law isn't there, and if you're from a company, your risk assessment will not let you go in and invest. And that has ramification effects because then you can't create jobs and you can't really contribute to this broader global good that we're all talking about. Each of these factors stifles entrepreneurial creativity and works to the great detriment of worldwide business and commercial stability. The rule of law is also concerned with legal identity and empowerment for individuals and organizations, enabling transition from the informal sector into the formal economy a key issue that I hope we will get to address in the discussion. And as we've already heard, such individuals and organizations are actually also at the base of many companies' supply chains. The SDGs are ambitious. They're bold and they're truly transformative. They're a set of goals that really aspire to make the world a better place for all. But achieving the SDGs will require an unprecedented level of commitment by all stakeholders, be it government, be it intergovernmental organizations like ourselves, be it civil society, academia, or the private sector. And we will all need to come together to find new solutions to build this flourishing, abundant world that we all know is possible. I truly believe that the private sector is arguably one of the most important actors needed to solve the challenges outlined by the SDGs. But there are challenges because one of the key issues that has come up is that we know that there is a question of eroding tr 
trust by consumers that question the role of the private sector and what can the private sector really do. However, two weeks ago, I was in Davos at the World Economic Forum and there saw the latest Edelman 2018 trust barometer that I think gives us actually some good, um, I think there are two key findings in, the, in this uh, year's report that I think speak to what we're discussing today. Globally, 72% of employees trust in their employers to do what's right. Mm -hmm. So that actually points to those higher up in the, the chain of command in the private sector to really identify these strategies that we're discussing today. And the second key point is that business is expected to be an agent of change. 64% of respondents believe a company can take actions that both increase profits and improve economic and social conditions in the community where it operates. Idealio has always taken great pride in our engagement with different actors, including business. It's a pleasure for me to be in this conversation today because it is really a continuation of a shared purpose discussion we held here during the General Assembly with the Global Action Platform and the Diplomatic Courier, other partners like the International Chamber of Commerce and various Fortune 500 companies, but also some other small medium um, and medium enterprises and um, companies that were just beginning to start because we feel that there is a very important discussion. We know that business plays a key role in ensuring transformation takes place at the local level, but we also know that it's a two-way discussion. We haven't always had business at the table, and I do want to give credit to those parts of the UN, like the Global Compact, like DESA, that have allowed that to happen. Um, but it's an important conversation that we need to continue. And it's also a two-way discussion because the private sector we know, and I think others will make this point, has opportunities. It's not just about philanthropy, it's not a charity conversation, it's not about corporate social responsibility. This is part and parcel of the core business of any company that now wants to have the license to operate in the 21st century. As Louise said, it's very clear that the private sector can promote decent jobs and livelihoods, and more importantly, can bring about its R&D mechanisms to find innovative solutions to the challenges that we face today. But we would be very naive if we didn't recognize the barriers, and I think Jean-Pierre very kindly outlined a number of those. And I think this is where Idealo has been in this business of helping developing countries, in essence, open the doors for business for the last 30 years. There's a big question around and where we hope without going into the overburdening regulatory frameworks, we do know that one of the challenges towards investment is actually making sure that countries have the right frameworks, not just the right laws, but the right lawyers and the right judges that will be able to arbitrate, that will be able to resolve claims, and that will be able to ensure that when a business or a company decides to invest, that it's going to be a good business decision overall for business and for the country. We actually began, uh, the reason why Idealo was founded was actually because a group of lawyers felt that the developing world needed better lawyers that were able to negotiate complex agreements. And we've continued that process. Jean-Pierre also talked about emerging markets. One of the projects that we're proudest of is the project that we launched at the General Assembly this year in September, which is about helping least developed countries, i.e. those that have faced the biggest barriers towards investment, build up and develop the capacity to be able to negotiate complex agreements. We know that that has always been one of the biggest challenges for countries that are very often resource rich and that have the necessary local abilities to create good jobs and employment. So very happy to provide further information on how that project to assist least developed countries is coming up. Intellectual property rights is a massive issue. Without respect for IP, who is going to innovate? Who is going to go into a country and make sure that you're giving out the best advice and the best of technology that you have? The IP program is one of the ones that we have been running for the longest time and one that, again, we're very <coughs> proud of. And one of my favorite ones, which is a relatively new addition to our program portfolio, but I think very relevant, is the one that uh, relates to what Jean-Pierre just mentioned, which is around small, medium enterprises. Particularly in relation to women entrepreneurs, we are very much focused right now on identifying what are those same legal barriers that stop 
women entrepreneurs from developing their own business. And just as a little hint, it's the same things that stop any woman from having access to justice. So whether it's to prevent violence against women or to make sure that you have your contract enforced, there really isn't that much difference. So it tells us that there are very many systemic issues that we need to address. Finally, let me close with the words of Desmond Tutu. The strengthening the rule of law is an essential ingredient to enhance justice, <coughs> peace, and economic and social progress. So I'm delighted to know that there's great agreement about the importance of this, and I hope that I can count on other support to identify ways in how we can work together to make the rule of law a reality for all. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Stefano Severi. Stefano is a UN head of Cocoa, Palm Oil and Environmental Sustainability Department, working with Ferrero. He has, uh, uh, he has a degree in chemistry and master in uh, sustainable development. He's very active in the food sector for more than 20 years is experience in production quality and R&D, uh, making the link with what uh, just uh, Judith was uh, saying. And he, in uh, 2012, uh, Stefano joined the Sustainability World after his experience as one of the founders of Ampelos, an Italian NGO operating in East Africa. Stefano, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the 10 minutes. I hope to respect them. Um, my aim is to bring all of you on the ground in the cocoa supply chain. So I take it as an exercise for, for the today 10 minutes to bring all of you on the ground and to show you without tackling the poverty in the supply chain of cocoa, there will be no cocoa in the future and why this. And how a private company like Ferrero is changing the way of doing business in the cocoa sector. So Ferrero is a 12 billion US dollar company with more or less 40,000 employees around the world, transforming each year more than 1.2 million tons of raw materials in goods. 40% of the raw materials are produced by smallholders. When we think about smallholders, remember always between two and four hectares. That's more or less the average in the world. Very often in countries affected by the effects of climate change. And I think all of you remember what happens in West Africa. There are beautiful maps where you see the suitable land available in the next 20 years. The suitable land available in the next 20 years for coffee, for palm oil, for cocoa is decreasing. It's decreasing because climate change is affecting those countries much more than our countries. Our cocoa supply chain is composed by more than 100,000 farmers mainly in West Africa, in more than 1,000 communities, and are involving more than 800,000 people, if we look one to wives, children, grandparents, and so on. It means that by the end of the day, each employee of Ferrero has to take care of 20 persons only in the cocoa supply chain. The main business of Ferrero, as you know, is confectionery sector, where cocoa is an irreplaceable ingredient. You can produce bar of chocolate using substitute of milk, using substitute of sugar, but you cannot produce chocolate without using cocoa. And last but not least, before going on the cocoa supply chain and bring you on the ground, if you ask a child at school in a cocoa growing country what he wants to do when he grows up, he will never answer you a farmer and a cocoa farmer especially. That's very important. Few numbers on the cocoa sector. Roughly 4.5 million tons produced yearly, involving 40, 50 million people with four, five million farmers. And 95 persons of the farmers are smallholders. And very often they are not organized, so they don't have access to the market. 75% is growing in West Africa, where we know that we have many other issues also from the social point of view and of political point of view. Going a little bit deeply, as you, as you probably know, there is a big increase of deforestation in these countries like Ghana, Ivory Coast, and Nigeria. So the land suitable for cocoa is decreasing due also to this very heavy deforestation that has affected both countries. 
60% of the farmers are not organized yet. The living income average between Ghana and Ivory Coast is 91 cents per day. So we have 125 for extreme poverty level. We are below extreme poverty. And if you are a cocoa farmer in Ivory Coast or Ghana, normally in the 95% of the cases, you are below the extreme poverty. The average age of the farmers are 40 years. Normally, a suitable average a year is 25 years, so the farm itself is not sustainable. The life expectancies of the farm is 52, 52 years, and the life expectancies and the life of the farmers today is 40 years. So also, the generation is becoming older and older and is affected by these kind of problems. And the yield is very low. You can imagine normally a farm in West Africa is producing 500 kgs per hectare. If you go to a modern farm in South America, you produce six times more. It's six times more revenue. This is a very important thing. So very often the farmers are producing by small farmers run by family in developing countries contrary to industrial agribusiness. These small-scale farmers often must rely on outdated farming practices with limiting agricultural knowledge and resources. Farmers face significant challenges and encounter the complexity of economic, social, and environmental issues, such as the increased competition by other crops. Just to mention you few issues on the economic and social environmental point of view that are facing smallholders in the cocoa sector, low living income, remember the 91 cents, labor cost, poor farming practice, poor infrastructure, human rights violation. We always heard about child labor, but there are many other kinds of violation in terms of human rights. Food security, nutrition, water access, gender inequality, illiteracy and education, aging and disease of the cocoa trees, deforestation, low biodiversity and soil degradation, climate change effects, impact of fertilizer and pesticides. So very often in these countries, the farm is left alone. In the past year, the development of the major certification scheme and the creation of collective programs such as the World Cocoa Foundation, the International Cocoa Initiative and Cocoa Action by World Cocoa Foundation have been able to bring a positive change in the cocoa sector and achieve significant results. Even so, due to a series of concurring factors in Ivory Coast and in Ghana, one of the major cocoa producing countries, the average income of the cocoa farmers is always below the extreme poverty line. So which is the solution? We think that the solution is again to bring the farmer at the center of the supply chain. Today the farmer is not in the center of the supply chain, it's at the end of the supply chain. For us it's very important to bring the farmer to get with the consumer and try to bring a very long relationship I heard before the colleagues talking about trust. For me, trust is transparency. Mm. And companies have to be very transparent in terms of what they are doing, in terms of how they communicate, and in terms also when they are not succeed. Because today the consumer are ready to understand if a company is not succeeding and is also able to understand it. But a company has to face it and to be as much as he can transparent along all the supply chain. So the only way to fight poverty in the cocoa supply chain is bringing again the farmer at the center of the supply chain. And fighting the poverty from the beginning, we can avoid all the problems linked to the cocoa supply chain. Like for example, the not access to credit, they don't have bank account. 85% of the cocoa farmers don't have any bank account. So they are not accountable. They don't have the money to bring their children to school. They are not able to invest in their farms. They are not able to use good pesticide and good fertilizer. So very often they buy copycat. They are not able to hire proper people. What is the most simple way? I take my children in the, in the farm and I let them work instead of going to school. And I don't make profit. If I don't make profit, the loop is going again. So the new strategy that we are setting linked to the SDGs that we mentioned before has an horizon as 2030 with three key pillars. One is improve farmers and community livelihoods. Cocoa farmers have to live from their work and need to have access to farm services, good clonal material, crop protection products, inputs, community services like classroom, medical dispensaries, clean water and sanitation, women empowerment, 
I always remember what colleagues of Oxfam told me. One dollar invested in one woman is seven dollar payback. One dollar invested in a man is one dollar payback. That's very clear in our mind. Protect and respect children's rights. Our farmer children need to have the same opportunities and room for joyful growth by having access to appropriate food and balanced diet. It seems far away, but very often they only eat cassava, only eat rice. They don't have access to vitamin. They don't have access to meat. That's a very important damage for the brain development. They don't have access to education. Remember that in Ivory Coast, 1.5 million of children are not registered. If you are not registered, you have not access to the secondary school. Clean water and vaccination. And safeguard the natural capital. Cocoa as friend of the forest. This approach will ensure that biodiversity is protected in the cocoa producing countries, providing a natural barrier to erosion and effective and vital greenhouse gases capture system. So our challenging goal is to bring the farmers out of the poverty. We think that the positive effect will be done by a domino effect. First of all, fighting poverty, and from fighting poverty, we will protect the children from one side and the ca natural capital from the other side. Last but not least, it's very important to take care of the present, the existing farming, and prepare the next generation of farmers. That means also to be resilient. Many thanks. And uh, last but not least, we, uh, I would like to invite now Professor Kurt Budwig, is the chairman of the Baltic, uh, the Baltic Sea Forum um, uh, since, 19, uh, uh, since 2003 to present. Um, he has been, uh, uh, the uh, Baltic Sea Forum is an energy uh, that earned consultative status with the ECOSOC in 2008. Uh, yeah, Mr. Berdwig is also a European coordinator of the Baltic Adriatic Core Network Corridor since uh, 2014 to present. He has uh, also served as a member of the German Bundestag. Uh, he has been a federal minister of transport, housing, and building in Germany. He has worked in the European, in the Committee of the European Affairs of the German Bundestag. He has been a member of the Council of Europe. Um, he uh, has been, been also a member of the Baltic Sea mm -hmm. Parliamentary Conference and, the Marit and also as a maritime ambassador of the European Commission in Germany. He has uh, a really tremendous experience in transport um, uh, policy and infrastructure. Actually, he mm -hmm. is a professor at the, univers uh, at the University of Applied Science in Osnabrück. And, um, and uh, he is also honorary professor of transport policy, infrastructure, and logistics in uh, Eifei University in China. Thank you for bringing all of your experience to this uh, round table. The, the mic is yours, you have 10 minutes. Yes, thank you very much. Not all experience, but some. <laughs> but, but after this concrete example, this, uh, uh, which uh, Stefano has uh, just uh, mentioned before, so I will go a little bit more in principle. When we see back uh, some years ago when the SDG process started, nobody would uh, believe in this time that we're sitting today here and speaking about how to bring public sector and private sector together to, to have one common goal just to create another more livable world. And that's uh, what I say just to the beginning. Public sector and private sector are not versus. They need each other. That is necessary to, uh, to understand because we have very different discussions in the past. And I think what we need is if we have common goals and the SDGs are strong goals and we need to fulfill them because otherwise this world is in danger then I think it's necessary to create a process where we all strengthen uh, the process to reach the goals. And the goals are a lot of goals, but for me, poverty or addiction is in the center of all what we have to do with the SDGs, because it's not a question of living, it's also a question of living conditions. 
and we have come together, and I think the best chances to eradicate uh, poverty is to create alternatives, beginning by the chances for professional education. It's necessary. Beginning by uh, education which create later new chances to create jobs in a growth process, and uh, also just do all the things which are necessary to, to, uh, to realize this principle, leaving no one behind. And if we discuss it, then I think what we need for the private sector and the civil society is an ethical responsibility. That must be just a guideline for all what we do, for all process we create, and for all programs we bring forward. And let me say something what we had discussed before. We need incentives, we need impulses, we need to stimulate it, a process also in the less developed regions of the world that we, we get a more equal living standard worldwide. It's not easy because we are very far away from this, but that must be what we see. And I just support uh, Jean-Pierre's uh, approach about trust Trust is a cornerstone, and what I see is that corruption is a cancer, the cancer, because we have, to, we have to fight against this cancer corruption worldwide, and it's not only in the less developed countries. We see it everywhere, and therefore I think the principle, and there are, I state to, uh, to you, did, a functioning law is fundamental for this process, and we have to work for this. And Stefano, I think transparency, yes. We have to create a situation where we can see all what happened in the world, what happened in each society, and how does it work. And if it's in a bad way, then we have to change it. And if it's in the right way, we have to force it. And then I will say something to public goods. I think what we need worldwide, and just also in the region, in the Baltic Sea region, in Northeast Europe, I would say is, that we need equal chances for the people, but also public goods, which are the fundamental basic for just a living standard for all the people. And therefore, I think the question of tax situation, I think I'm against too hard tax structures, but weak tax structures are also a danger because then we have no chances to create programs, to give impulses and or incentives for a changing way. Now I will say something what we do in our organization, the Baltic Sea Forum, which is a network of networks. Mm -hmm. So we try to bring the people together to the actors, and we are just also involved in the macro-regional uh, uh, Baltic Sea strategy, where we, where we create projects which are have a main principle to share knowledge, to bring different partners, partners from different regions together and to say, what will we do? We will connect SDG 1 with SDG 9, with the environmental responsibility, and therefore we create a transport uh, infrastructure which goes back to more environmental friendly uh, supply chain where we say, okay, let us do, in the past we were creating a rail freight system in Eastern Europe, which brings, which shift the transport volume back to the rail because it's more environmental friendly, but it has to be also a business case. If there's no business case, then it will not work. And then I will speak about our uh, uh, ethical principles. What we do in our last project, the Amber Coast Logistic, was that we also create professional education by our partners, perhaps in Belarus, which the situation is not so good. And then in following very good, well-educated professional workers, then they have also chance to get jobs, that because that are conditions which we need. And that is the part which we do, and I think it's necessary to do it in very concrete projects, because that is the basic where we bring public and private together, and we have sustainable goals. That is with the lead partner, which is also in the room, uh, it's Hamburg uh, Hafen, Hamburg Port Marketing, 
which are a good lead partner for such projects. And now we try to renew the, the inland waterways because it could also help to create more growth in the regions because you need infrastructure. And then I would speak in my last point to the infrastructure. I think infrastructure is the access to the market. If you have no infrastructure, then cooker will not be transport, then the prices go down, and so on, and so on, and so on. And therefore, and that's just also my profession, <laughs> to, to force infrastructure, I think we have also created new ways. We need grants for the structure, but we can also work with uh, user pays principles or polluter based principles, which is very near to sustainable uh, goals. And therefore, I think what we need is a mixture of different measures, bring them together and try to create more better SDG results than in the past. And last but not least, I will tell a, a short story to, from my hometown, is Hamburg. The city of Hamburg is a 1.8 million inhabitants uh, living there it's, uh, with a good behavior. But what we have are more than 1,400 social foundations, mm -hmm. mostly created by, by companies or well-situated persons. Mm -hmm. And they work with poor children and give them a good education in the kindergarten and later on. Mm -hmm. Or they work with, uh, with initiatives in social problematical quarters to give them a new chance to bring uh, effect, just work together, come together. And therefore, I will say, if we have success in business, then I think it's good to give a part back to the society. Thank you very much. Uh, hometown. Uh, it has been uh, um, really uh, all this presentation by the uh, panelists have been insightful, and uh, I hope that it will help um, help um, proceed with the, the debate, with our discussions. Uh, one of the person has to um, to leave, but she will come back, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, she told me that she will be back. So we will uh, we have, we have. Um, um, uh, several persons has a discussion, so we are at least uh, five. I will probably start with um, Tony Mahabir. Tony Mahabir recently... Huh? Um, everyone will have, uh, will have um, uh, three minutes to, make, to ask questions. Uh, please make your questions quite brief. And then we will try also, once you, you will uh, we dealt with your questions, we will try to in include all the participants in the Q&A session. In total, we will have about um, uh, one hour uh, to, um, to continue the debate. Tony Mabir is the chairman and CEO of Canfin Financial Group of Companies, an entity which provides professional wealth management advisory services to businesses, professionals, and individuals across Canada and globally. He has a large and long experience, solid experience in the financial business. He's been uh, really con um, uh, focusing on uh, strategy, cultural, uh, cultural diversity, etc. I think uh, that you have a lot to say and uh, representing finance in this debate. Thank you. Thank you. Three minutes. Thank you. Um, I think. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, okay. I have question in general to the entire panel, whoever wished to take it on. But I do want to say that uh, we work at a granular level with individuals at the at the ground level and financial planners all around the world. There's about a million of us, and uh, we work with families every single day. Sometimes several appointments. So if you do the math, millions of financial planner, several appointments a day. We know firsthand there's a direct link between education and wealth. There's a direct link between poverty and knowledge. And I think the goal of the eradication of poverty through literacy, and in my particular case, financial literacy, are in inextricably linked. And my question to our distinguished panel here today is what are the factors for successful um, CSR? 
uh, practices, especially when we look at the three dimensions of social, environmental, and um, in an economic sense. And, and why has CSR efforts not been as productive as they could be? Um, the, the reality is that uh, how can companies act uh, uniformly when legal requirements on labor, on environmental issues do vary between different countries uh, which they operate. So what may be ethical in one region of the world may not necessarily be ethical. One region of the world has a government that's committed to, um, to its citizens and corporate, social, and, and, and human humanitarian uh, conditions, and you have others that may not. So how can we take a one-size-fit-all CSR approach. Take the question. We we uh, probably we will do a round of questions and I will introduce all the uh, discussions before and then we will deal with the question. Sorry, <laughs> please be indulgent with me. <laughs> okay, now I would like to introduce um, uh, Siv Young, founder and global executive of Covram Table. Steve Young is, so I have to find my paper with all the details here. Steve Young, um, uh, yesterday, uh, Global di Director, Executive Director of Coron Table, an international network of experienced business leaders who advocate a principal approach to global capitalism. Uh, Steve has ro uh, ro um, written um, uh, two books, one on moral capitalism and the second one on the way to moral capitalism. He, uh, he, uh, he, has, uh, he received an award. Uh, one of uh, Professor Sandra Waddock of the Carroll School of Management of Boston College has listed Steve Young among 23 persons who created the corporate social responsibility movement. Mm. And uh, this is uh, really a very nice award you got. Um, he is also a member of the board of Man Magni uh, Global Assets. Uh, he is a member of uh, the US Advisory Council uh, to the Papal Foundation. And uh, he is a professor teaching corporate social responsibility at the Carlson School of management at the University of Minnesota and other uh, universities, also in Thailand. Steve, you are really an expert on uh, corporate social responsibility, so maybe you would like also to intervene. Um, is my assignment, like Tony's, to frame this as a question, or what would what would be most helpful to the group in the discussion? You can make a statement first and then ask uh, the question you I think would like perhaps to let me to try to do, I was thinking, listening to you of the, the, the American TV game Jeopardy, where, where you may, you, you're supposed to make a factual statement, only you have to do it as a question. So, so um, let me uh, sort of uh, try to integrate two uh, thought of the panel is, in listening to the panel and, and, and following the development of the SDGs, uh, one can only conclude uh, that systems theory is at work. And why is it that no one ever talks about systems theory? I mean, systems theory is, is a way of thinking about subsystems and the interrelations of subsystems and feedback loops and, and virtuous circles and, and destructive circles. And if you want A, you got to worry about B. But if you want B, you have to worry about C. But A is actually the thing that creates C. So you really can't talk about A or B or C. Somehow you got to talk about A and B and C. And then you have, you have issues of, of temporal sequence. Uh, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? If you want eggs, you got to start with chickens, right? But if you want chickens, you got to start with eggs. So if you really have neither a chicken nor an egg, i.e. you want a lot of wealth and make people happy, but you're very poor, what do you do tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock? You eat cereal, right? Um, so you've got that. And then you have causal connections. Which, come, which comes first? Is it, is it the wealth that, that creates the culture? And that's sort of a Marxist concept. Or is it the culture that creates the wealth? That's the, the Weberian concept. So I guess my, my question to the panel is, is would we not get a lot more done on the ground at a granular way, as Tony was talking about it, if we expressly talked in terms of systems and systems theory? Thank you. 
Kustra. She has a long, long experience. She has been really a great expert in medicine since a long time ago. Um, she worked in social pediatrics in the United States. She also an MA, an MA in public administration, doc doctorate in public health. She's also a specialist of public health administration, hospital administration, and financial management of our health programs, design, and the implementation of local health system and gender programs administration. Currently, she resides in Brazil. She's the president of the World Family Organization, an NGO founded in 1947. Uh, founded in 1947, uh, I'm sorry, yes, <laughs> I lost my, um, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, World Family Organization is based in, in Paris, France. Uh, she, the, uh, the organization affiliates NGOs working the family business, ministries of family and ministries of social affairs, universities and local authorities in 187 countries. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, Daisy. Really, Daisy Costa represents the World Family Organization in the United Nations governments and the intergovernmental organization as the Arab League and the African Union. Uh, she's a consultant to many uh, international institutions. I think we need your insight now. Thank you. You have three minutes. And also ask a question. Thank you very much, Cosima. Thank you very much, Daniela and Jean-Pierre, to invite me to be in this panel, what I'm finding extremely interesting. Actually, I think one of the first things I learned today is that we want to speak about the SDGs and five. When we refer to women, we want to talk about people with attitudes. And now I learned another expression with people with special needs, people with determination. This is something incredible. I found extremely uh, interesting the presentation of uh, Kurt and Stefano. We are working in the bottom of the pyramid, so it means people under the institution of family. So you refer to the chain, the supply chain, that we always, in our countries, we are talking with the big companies, with big regulations, with big accords, with the governments. And actually, we forget that who really supplies, who really works, are the people that are the producers and consumers of goods and services and they are the ones that are not hurt, and the ones where poverty actually is the reality day by day. Uh, my question is, this is an incredible uh, time to make some cha deep changes in the thinking of how we can think about creating the social capital and the corporate response, social responsibility. How can you, in your organization, bring to the surface local authorities that are the ones that the first families where they are working in a small and medium enterprise, they have to deal, not with the really uh, national governments, how we can bring families and local authorities to be partners in this discussion, knowing that it's not enough to eradicate poverty. We will not really achieve this. We have really also to tackle how we are going to stop the transmission, intergenerational transmission of poverty. And listen to you, it's my question. How you could contribute to that, bringing families, local authorities, subnational governments, and then to the table, to the national, international area, 
to combat poverty. I would like to introduce um, Mr. Angus Brenny, who comes uh, from uh, works for the UN Global Compact, a senior manager in charge of the partnership and the UN relation for the uh, United Nations Global Compact. Angus Rainey uh, is, um, uh, is uh, yeah, the uh, Global Compact is the world's largest responsible business initiative. In addition to a portfolio of involving a, a broad range of partnership brokering activities with Global Compact, participant companies, uh, UN partners, and other uh, stakeholders, Angus also coordinates a UN network of more than 100 staff focused on strengthening the capacity of the organization to engage in the, pri uh, the private sector, advancing UN issues and goals while promoting responsible and sustainable business. Angus, you have three minutes for a statement and your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cosima. It's a real pleasure to be here. What an amazingly interesting conversation, um, and what a what an alignment and convergence of thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we started with hearing from Daniela around some of the solutions that exist from a public policymaker's perspective around the role of business. We've heard business voices really echoing that and reinforcing that. We've heard about the importance of enabling environments. The the, the, the fundamentals of the rule of law, transparency, and anti-corruption, and you know, so much has been said that I was hoping to contribute, so it's a great affirmation of uh, much of the work the Global Compact is doing. I, I did, before posing my question, want to uh, add another layer of solutions to the conversation. Uh, the Global Compact is trying to raise the ambitions of businesses around the world to contribute to the 2030 Agenda. And this year, um, we launched uh, a resource called the, uh, the Blueprint for SDG Leadership mm -hmm. um, that is calling on companies to do more than they already are. And we've seen some great progress, but um, we need to raise the stakes. We need intentional, ambitious, consistent, collaborative, and accountable leadership from the private sector working with the UN and governments and civil society if we're going to achieve the agenda. And uh, this resource provides goal by goal uh, very concrete prescriptions around specific ways that companies can take action and ideally also achieve business success in doing so. So we've heard a lot of the solutions that were in the blueprint discussed in various ways when it comes to eradicating poverty. Engaging in job creation, especially in LDCs and especially for vulnerable populations. Programs to empower economically disadvantaged mm -hmm. groups ensuring decent working conditions, um, and also providing products and services for that bottom of the pyramid population that, that, that can really be supported through business ingenuity and, and entrepreneurship. So we're all very aligned, um, but there's an elephant in the room, and I think that's short-termism. I think we've heard the long-term vision mm -hmm. outlined. We know where we need to go. We, we know there are solutions, but particularly um, in, in the marketplace, I think there's still tremendous pressure to deliver sort of quarterly returns mm -hmm. um, to shareholders uh, in a way that is not conducive to taking this kind of leadership. So I guess my question to the group is how do we further incentivize and reward um, businesses that are um, trying to earn the trust of other stakeholders through responsible leadership? Okay. So who wants to answer some of these questions uh, among the panelists? Mr. Berwick. Thank you very much. So I will ask, uh, 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 Daisy has asked us, us both, and I, I just will tell a little bit uh, uh, from my view. I think what we need is break the role. In the traditional family situation in uh, many parts of the world, especially in the less developed regions of the world, is uh, the mother is just organizing the family, but the, the presenting it by the father, mostly the father is away. And if you see this idea, then I think the main issue is same chances for all. If we, have, uh, if we create uh, professional education, not only for the oldest boy, just also for the oldest girl, and so on and so on. And if you bring that back to the regions, 
then you need a special development strategy for each region in the world. And that is what we, we're creating with the EMMA project. EMMA is a female European name, but that's, uh, that's not the point. The point is that we try to renew the inland waterways. We do it in, in just regions in Europe, in Northeast Europe, which we have uh, losing uh, the population in the countryside. Mm. So if you see a country like uh, Let uh, Letland, uh, Latvia, so it's just more than half of the population is only living in the capital city. And so with, with the field of the infrastructure which is usable, which can create at the point where the bridges or the cities are, a, a new market, new, uh, new opportunities, then you have a good chance to develop. And if you do it in Africa, so I know a lot of projects that they build very expensive motorways and railways, but there are no markets. That white elephants, but we have just a lot of rivers where the people living along the river because it needs the water. And therefore, we, we try to create both a development, as you say, at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, which helps the people who are living in this specific regions, which are the producers of agriculture products, and so on. But that is just my uh, approach to say, let us create regional, uh, let us uh, create regional programs, but at the same principles we need worldwide, and that is just transparency, anti-corruption, uh, poverty, eradication, and so on. And then perhaps we are on, on a good way. I ho hope it was not too long, sorry. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Bardwick. Uh, we have um, other questions that need to be answered with, uh, with willing to take one of them. For example, how to bring a, a government and private um, uh, and private um, uh, companies to uh, work together. Who wants to take that question from uh, Daisy? Uh, if I can add something. Yes. One of the first question was why CSR is not productive. Exactly. So I would start from, from, from okay. uh, to, to, to try to answer to this question, which is absolutely not an easy question. So I, I come back to my, to my roots. I'm a chemist, and being a chemist it means that more or less you should know what happens. So you take hydrogen and oxygen together, you put heat and you obtain water. In sustainability is not the case. So I always say, and I think it's very unpolite, but I, I have to say it's, sustainability is not a science yet. So very often we are facing this problem also in our company and in, in uh, other private sectors where you have to demonstrate with numbers. Until it's linked to the environmental, I think there is quite a stronger base, even if I think to become a science, it will be need probably some decades. But when we go to the social sphere, it's very, very hard. We are trying to do it with some uh, NGOs to try to, to see and to measure the social value that we are adding in our supply chain. And believe me, we start five years ago and we have no numbers. That's why sometimes I think that CSR is not productive because when you go outside, you need numbers. That's, that's the private sector is, is working this way. You cannot say my feeling is that or it seems that. You have to, to, to put numbers in a piece of paper. And as I mentioned before, on the environmental part, I think the private sector is uh, going quite fast. On the social sphere, who I think is becoming more and more important, that's another point. I think when the companies embrace sustainability, they embrace before the environmental part because what was the part where there was money. There was money easy to bring it home. So everyone was focusing on the environmental part in the first phase. And on the social part, on the social sphere, I think it came much later because it's much more a long-term investment. And you see the results if you are able after 10, 15, 20 years. On the environmental part, I change a motor. I, I immediately make a safe on electricity and I can make a countable in few, in few minutes. I can measure and I can make the account. If I measure a child who is going to school instead of working in a cocoa farm, and then after 10 years he goes to a high school and so on, to measure the effect on the ground, it, it takes so, so long time that we will arrive one day. I think we'll be not my generation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jean-Pierre, maybe you want to answer the question about short-termism? 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that the question about short-termism, especially in the financial market, is essential because the whole financial system nowadays is built on short-termism. Um, when you know that financial products that are out there and have been produced by these financial product producers, which we will not name, is uh, 10 times world GDP nowadays. And these products have short lifespans, and they're all based on uh, listed stocks. Um, and there's 25,000 listed stocks in the world, which are decreasing because more and more companies realize that having their stocks listed on the stock market is a significant danger because these stocks will be integrated into products and depending on how the products evolve, suddenly they can have a severe backlash on the stock market price without any reason and completely out of control, which is based on short-termism. Um, I believe that the system right now will need a very serious shakeup to change that mentality and to bring people again in a way to think long-term. Nowadays in the financial world, long-term is two years. You know, you cannot make sustainable development projects with a vision on two years. You need 10, 15, 25 years. Um, but, but the question is fully justified and it's a real concern uh, in the financial market because everything is being played between three and six months. Thank you for having asked the question. Thank you, thank you. Now that uh, we have the pleasure to have back in the room uh, Mr. Chantal Lynn Carpentier, I will, I will uh, ask her whenever she's ready to to uh, to interact and also ask a question. Chantal Lynn Carpentier, uh, she is a ch chief at UNTA, the New York office, and the office of the uh, Secretary General. She is a Canadian economist uh, specializing in sustainable agriculture de development, trade, and consumption and production. She joined the uh, UNCTAD in uh, 2014 as a chief after sev seven years in managing the intergovernmental processes at the United, Department, United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs at the Division of Sustainable Development. She coordinated the participation of a record of 10,000 plus non-state actors in Rio plus 20 a conference and supported the sustainable development goals for the post-2015 um, development agenda. Uh, um, Chantal, you can make a statement about the topic of the day and then ask a question to our panelists. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Kasima. And I, apologies, I had to actually step out right, to meet the ambassador. So, um, and I was able to listen up to about half of uh, Stefano's presentation, which was very interesting. So I'm sorry if I missed the <laughs> other half and then missed the others. Um, I just want to pick on a few issues that have been uh, mentioned. Uh, related to poverty, of course. Um, and you mentioned, uh, Louise mentioned the LDCs and you mentioned the LDCs, Judith. And for us, we just issued a, uh, a report today showing that basically investment is actually reducing, re decreasing in LDCs. Um, and ODA is also decreasing, especially externally oriented ODA. And how do we expect then the LDCs to actually then um, be able to eliminate poverty and beat the SDGs? And if we don't meet the, SD the SDGs and the LDCs, that means we're not meeting Agenda 2030, we're not meeting the SDGs, because we can't leave anyone behind. So we need to find a way of how do we how do we make it easier, how do we make it enticing for the private sector to invest in LDCs? And clearly so far we've not been able to do that. And it's not just the rule of law, it's, it's, transformation, it's transformational economy, it's productive capacity of those countries, and ability to trade um, and export and the infrastructure that they have. So that was one point I want to raise. I want to raise also, there was mentioned in different points the, the issue of inequality and the inequality of outcome 
and but also the inequality of opportunity. And the latest World uh, Inequality Report from the 2018 basically says uh, that the bottom 50% of the population has grabbed 13% of the growth since 1980, while the top 1% captured twice as much of that growth since 1980. Well, clearly, and then a lot of the wealth of the wealthiest goes into financial asset, and we do not really have a registry of financial asset, and therefore it's impossible to tax it, it's impossible to actually have a discussion about, about that money. So the World Inequality Lab is actually calls for some sort of a register and some sort of um, um, idea of, uh, uh, so we can have a sense of just like with housing and, and, and land, who owns what. Mm. Um, and I say that because one of the things, and Stefano, you mentioned the issue of the, the smallholders and that um, I believe you said 40% of your producers are smallholders, and that's true for all these commodities, cafe, cacao, cafe, and others. And somehow, with all the knowledge that we have and all the capacity that we have, we can't figure out a way. We have, at the end of the chain, people that are starving, their children are saying, we're not going to do this again because there's no money to be made and we're barely, and then yet... We, and we love cacao, we all love chocolate, and we want to make sure there's going to be chocolate in the future, and we can't solve that problem. It's impossible. We need to be able to find a way that there's a redistribution along that chain so that smallholder makes enough money um, and has enough. Um, and it's not just the, it, we're not just talking here about the business sector. It's also the rural urban infrastructure issue. It's the lack of access to a school, to education, to health issues um, that need to be resolved if we want to resolve these issues. Now, we're working at UNCTAD on this issue, on the, um, the second generation of investment treaties. And so a lot of the treaties are coming due, the investment, bilateral uh, investment treaties are coming due. The issue is what is the opportunity now to realign those investment with the SDGs, to make it easier. So investment promotion, so they will be aligned with the investment promotion of the import-export um, agencies to ensure that this, these investment actually support the SDGs as opposed to um, going away from them. And I want to get to an issue of, of legitimacy because everybody talked about the trust issue. And it is true that uh, there is uh, some very good news, as Judith mentioned, but there's another good news when you work for the UN is that the trust in the UN is actually the only place, I think, where the trust is increasing. <laughs> and that means the UN has a value add for people to work with the UN because that people somehow trust the UN. Um, and so it brings me to my second point that we also, and Essa, you mentioned that, we can't, the UN cannot meet this SDG alone, and each of our government can't do it. We need to bring the private sector. We need multi-stakeholder initiative so that the whole ecosystem of all the issues that need to be resolved are filled. And yet, we have those multi-stakeholders initiative, but they don't have the legitimacy. And yet the UN and the Global Compact is trying to work at that, but we still do not have a way to bring these multi-stakeholder initiative within the UN and give them the legitimacy and the capacity to actually scale and be endorsed. And so I think this is another issue that we need, we need to, re to resolve so that we can recouple GDP with people-centered development and that leave no one behind, and yet decouple the production of our companies from natural resource use and environmental impact, because otherwise there's no way we can meet the SDGs. Um, in terms of, I guess my question would just be, uh, one more observation. When I was on the panel with Novozyme, what, what I find fascinating is that the SDGs, and uh, Louise is gone, but she was talking about the power of the SDGs for the private sector, and I was in Rio, and we never had that many uh, private sector in, in, in any of our conferences. And that interest has just grown. And the one, we don't even necessarily think of all the aspects, and some of them have been mentioned by Jean-Pierre and by Judith and Louise, but one of them that Nova Zai mentioned on one of the panels I thought was very interesting is when the country goes through this, it's, this, this whole effort of which SDG we're going to prioritize, they talk to all their stakeholders, they go from county to county and then province and state to state, they cluster them and they say these are going to be our priority, that sent a pretty strong signal to the private sector that these are the area where this government and the international community will be focusing for the next foreseeable future. And so for Novazyme, they, they saw that value in the, in the national voluntary review that country could do to, to present at the high level political forum 
in terms of implementation of DSDG. So there are several ways, but the question is we really need to find a way to have this idea of the legitimacy and ensuring that the, 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 the governance of these multi-stakeholder initiatives so that they deliver on the public good and that the people are actually going to trust them and find a way that these two can be connected to the, to the UN. And we don't have that platform. And I was at a uh, brainstorming session with um, the, the ambassador, of the DPR of Belgium, and he was saying, we don't even have a place to talk about inequality at the UN. None of our agencies is set up to talk about inequality. And he was suggesting maybe the Commission on Social St uh, Status should be talking about inequality. But there's a lot of areas we're not set up to talk about these issues. So I just leave it at you for maybe reacting. Who would this. like to react to this question <laughs> among the panelists? Well, if I may, Kazza uh, would just respond to, to three topics in terms of my question. Uh, Short-termism, investing in LDCs, and multi-stakeholder thing. They're all issues of, of systems theory. You cannot address, you cannot come up with relevant actions unless you think in terms of systems theory. Let me talk about short-termism. Okay, so what is involved short-termism versus long-termism? First of all, it's your risk profile. The, your risk profile then turns on where your risks come from. Are your risks only uh, tangible risks? Or are your risks, what, what are increasingly looked at as intangibles, reputational risk? Uh, if you think of, um, I'm not going to remember the numbers, but if you take the five uh, largest capitalized companies in the world, you take Alphabet, you take Facebook, you take Amazon, my guess is if you go to the balance sheet, well, these are, these are hundreds of billions of dollars in market, well, they're down now, right? 400 points down in the Dow, uh, again, so anyway, but still, a lot of money hundreds of billions of dollars of market value in these companies, if you look at their net tangible assets, it's maybe 10%, maso manus. That means 90% of the market value of these companies is air. It's just what, what market participants believe the stock is worth. But what goes into all that? It's, it's reputation, it's intellectual property, which was mentioned, it was management skill, it was social capital inside the company. It was the desire of 16-year-old teenage girls to buy cell phones. If, if once they sell every 16-year-old girl and, and all the new girls coming up to cell phones, what's, what's Apple going to do? Apple sales are starting to drop off. So many complicated things about the future. Um, that's at the company level. If you take the level of cocoa farmers, right? If I'm a cocoa farmer and I got a wife and three kids uh, and my survival this year depends on getting that cocoa crop done, I ain't going to take any risks to be crude. I'm not going to experiment with this or that, because what happens if the experiment doesn't work? The, my, the marginal utility to me of one extra penny is huge. If I already have some wealth, if I, ha if I can get another little piece of land here and I can experiment with a different form of fertilizer, with plant a different tree and wait five years or how well, however long Stefano it takes for the, you know, the first coconut, then maybe I'll do it. But if I'm hanging on with my, with my fingertips, my risk profile is different. Looking at companies in short-termism, it seems uh, quite clear, but very few people are analyzing this. There's a difference between whether you look at the profit and loss statement or the balance sheet. How do you tell whether your company is succeeding or not? Most of us these days look at the profit and loss statement, which is quarterly results. 150 years ago, when, when, when modern capitalism began or more, you looked at the balance sheet. How much is my company worth today? Uh, is it worth 500 million or 100 million? And if you look at the balance sheet, you inherently go long term. Why are we not creating intellectual leadership around the balance sheet? Second, investing in LDCs. To be very blunt, ladies and gentlemen, if a country is miserably managed, why am I going to invest, right? And whose responsibility is it to turn that country around? Not mine. I'm a foreigner. And by the way, if I happen to be a white male from an imperialistic national background and I go to some country and point my finger, <laughs> people will be upset, right? It's not my place to tell other people, other cultures, you know, how to run their lives. On the other hand, my money is my money, which then gets to another systems problem, it seems to me, which is, what is the relationship between self-interest and virtue? 
a lot of times, and especially in the context of the SDGs, we, we, we hear in terms of corporations and other things, it's fundamentally your moral duty, right? So uh, the Commission for Social Development is talking about a new ethic of global responsibility. That's an ethical response. Well, what price do I have to pay personally to have an ethic which helps you? Do you have any responsibility to help me? Is there an ethical responsibility on your part? Uh, who's talking about this? But it's, it's, it's systemic problems. Thirdly, multi-stakeholders. Every time you talk about multi-stakeholders, you have a different set of interests, a different set of values. You have potential conflicts. You have potential win-win. You also have potential zero-sum. Who, who even draws a big chart of all the different stakeholders and the different feedback loops back and forth and saying, if I do A, that will help Chantal, but in respect, I do this. But if I do B for her, because I really do have an ethical sense, then how do I balance my interests with my ethics? We also do not have a lot of talking about human nature, right? And Maslow's hierarchy, again, things like that. If I'm a more wealthy person, I think the record of human history tends to show I'm more likely to be generous. Also, if I feel supportive and loved and taken care of in a community, I am more likely, right? Not everybody, but I am more likely to want to reach out to contribute to the church or the mosque or the temple or something like that. And I mean, let me just close that, that these great issues have been discussed by, by the great religions over time. Uh, I mean, the one that comes to my mind, actually, is, is the first, the opening section of the book of Mencius, the Mencius, where, where, where Mencius creates this distinction between Li, which is profit and self-interest, and Ren Yi, which, which is uh, righteousness and, and good human nature. And he basically says, the king is asking him, saying, you're a wise man, you're an advisor, I've got problems of poverty in my country, surely you must have counsels of Li. You have counsels of self-interest to me. And Mencius gets quite offended and says, why, sire, do you use that word profit? I only have counsels to Ren Yi, which is humaneness and, and righteousness. So we as human beings, how, how do we choose? And to, to close in this session, what does the Commission for Social Development in the UN do to help us think through at this macro level our self-interest? versus some sort of an ethic. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question from, uh, from Daisy um, that we might, uh, someone might want to, re uh, to respond it uh, about to bring in. Uh, okay, you have a question? Go ahead. I thank you, Chair, and uh, I'm sorry I came late. Uh, from the mission of Nigeria, and I was very um, fascinated by what uh, our colleague Shanta has just shared, uh, talking about inequality. Uh, I have a little problem with uh, an issue on um, how do we make uh, the private sector to be more attractive to invest. And uh, with the last speaker, uh, I think uh, I, I have a question to ask. Let me start by saying, uh, to summarize, there are two levels of inequality that we, I think, is relevant to what we are discussing. The inequality of outcome, where you talk about gain, uh, more than the other in economic uh, transaction, and also the inequality of opportunity, you know, where we talk about denying access to institution. For us, a continent like Africa is suffering these two. And we cannot play ignorance to this, that the system is rigged in, I mean, in a way that it disfavor this group of countries. Their experience confirms it. We don't have to go historical. And their experience cannot be detached from their present circumstance, where they look like they are the architect of their own misfortune. But the truth is that the global system has been unfair into this one. So if we think about the jungle justice of uh, uh, winners have it all, then why do we need the UN? It means we are not really 
are alive to the responsibility of an institution like the UN. Take, for example, uh, illicit financial flow. We cannot be talking about making investment attractive for developing countries, particularly Africa, where there is no transparency between the investors and the resources that they are taking from countries, where books are kept in such a way that what they declared in their country of origin is different from what they declared in their country of operations. And so these are the issues that we're talking about when we talk about inequality. We'll talk about technology. You know, where Africa was one of the, has the earliest record of technological breakthrough and records that we know. But today, Africa is a net importer of technology. How did it happen? Because those who come never promote uh, 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 indigenous technology. And this has been the case. So if we are going to continue to relate in this unequal and unbalanced relationship, then we know who is at upper hand. Then the international system cannot claim to, to, to present us with a level playing ground. And so we can talk to businessmen when we talk about multi-stakeholder, that this is a matter of morality, just like you are saying, and this is a matter of impunity. There's so much impunity that are carried out against developing country. Why so? Why is it not done in their country of origin? A businessman cannot afford to keep his record on open in a developed country and it goes cut free. We've seen cases where those who are operating in, developed, in developing country declare different record and they declare a different one and they are punished and their countries take money from them as fines. Now, where should that money go? These are the issues. Somebody committed an offense somewhere. He has depraved those people. He has denied them. He has contributed to their downward and, you know, on development. And now he gets back to his country of origin, and you are finding and taking huge sum of money without making recourse to the country where the offense is committed. So let's, let's, let's keep the book open. Let's, di let's discuss with a fair mind, with open mind, and see that this system, we are just deceiving ourselves by not facing the reality. There is a conspiracy for, to keep this group of people, particularly in Africa, to continue to be servitude and to be slave to the developed country. Because this is the way we perceive it. The cost we pay for technology is rather too high than what we get back for our home product. The same group of people that, 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 that decide on what they pay or what we pay for their product decide what we pay for our home product. How just is that? So I, 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 was, I, was, I was moved to speak this way because I, I can see that you brought uh, a lot of uh, support from religion and all of that. There is no religion in this matter. It is deception. It is greed. It is love of profit that we need to face that this is not how it should be run. If we are going to have a level playing ground, we must put into consideration the history and the experience of this country that have suffered so much deprivation from slavery, from colonialism, and from all manners of injustice. So we need responsible investment. And I think the 2030 agenda give us a platform for this. We are businessmen and women can be fair and be equal in treating the country where they're investing overseas as well as their country of origin. If we can have this balance, of course, we are not lazy back in Africa. And if we have a problem, we also know that some other continents have their problem at a time. But the international system was not this unfair to them. I thank you. First response is, so what would you do tomorrow morning? Because tomorrow morning you can't change the international system. So where are the initial points? And I hear our colleagues here, and, and I hear the, I hear, been to many meetings around the SDGs over the last couple of years, people are looking for, what, what's the starting point? What, what can I do tomorrow? I can't solve the problem tomorrow. But I'm driving down the road, should I turn right, should I turn left? What, what should I do? Which institution should, uh, we, we, the rule of law or law, which, which, do I work with the lawyers first, do I work with the judges? Do I work with the legislature? Do I, do I, do I work with the local police at the village level? Well, what do I do? 
Do I try to get a World Bank? I mean, there's, there's so many things that we have created in the international system which could be done, and a lot of people have lost faith in most of them. So what are we going to do? First point. Second point, about 10 years ago, on, on this issue of, of, of the, um, the movement of wealth, illegally and illicitly, out of poor countries, I think, um, I don't know, do you know global financial integrity? There's a guy in Washington, D.C., Ray Baker. Uh, yeah, Ray, and you know Ray's work? The, if you look at his numbers for 20, 30 years, the amount of money which has left poor countries sent out by the people of those countries, not all the people, the ruling elites, it is, it is far more than all the trade benefits and all the development aid that's gone in. In other words, the poor countries of the world have been financing the money centers 20, 30 years. It's outrageous. And, and, and who's talking about it? And who's doing anything about it? So Ray tried to do something. So we did, we did a little project where we thought, we, uh, Lord Dan Brennan, the UK, was our chair at that point, and Dan had a great idea, which is you go after the assets in the money centers. You go to New York, you go to the condos in New York, you go to the Michael Jackson glove in, in um, Southern California, right, the, the famous one. You, you, go, you go to the, the, the mansions in, in London, and you, you go to their owners and you seize those assets because they're illegally gotten and they violated various laws. Then the question came up, okay, so I seize a house in London, and I sell it, uh, you know, through, through a court process for six, six million pounds. What do I do with the six million pounds? Who gets it? If I send it back to the country of origin, we have suspicions as to who's going to benefit from that money. If I put it in a trust fund at Barclays Bank in London, how does that help the poor people of that country? I, there's opportunity for things to be invented and created. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about, you talked about religion has no bearing on this. And to some extent, I agree with you. Power and systems are fundamental. But greed and the love of profit, this is the stuff that religions are worried about. Religions try to teach us to have self-control over our greed. And we can, we can quote, all of us may know from our own different faith traditions, <laughs> passages from this book and this, this important thinker that says it is, it is a wrong, it is wrong in human beings to chase greed and chase profit. And yet every day, human beings around the world chase greed and chase profit. But thank you for your, for your thoughts. Thank you, Steve. Uh, sometimes you would like to add something. <laughs> I just can't resist because Steve is so... <laughs> I love it. <laughs> He's there. Um, two things. And also, uh, Akin is actually the expert in repatriation of assets. So you want to we should, wait, talk wait. with him afterward. Well, <laughs> our, our effort, we got no support for our effort, I am sad to say. I am sad to say. But it's not going to happen tomorrow, so what do we do in the short term? And I, I forgot to mention that uh, Judith did mention contracts and the work you guys are doing to support countries to have the right contract. I mean, even our cities have problem to write a proper contract for, with the right KPI for a PPP. So imagine a developing country trying to get in these, into these, these very complex, and often these are very, very complex contracts. I, don't, I, I can't even read one. Um, and I have a PhD. So, you know, it's, it's, so I think what you're saying, the type of thing, so in the Interagency Task Force on Financing for Development, we're trying to work with the OECDs that has just issued the, the guidelines on blended financing, which are very weak. Uh, the IMF is coming out with something that's pretty downing on the blended financing because you need to be a super expert in these issues. So what is it that you guys can do to help us? You guys are expert in these things, at drafting these contracts that would be fair, that would include that fairness of risk, sharing of the risk and the return in a way that is beneficial both to the company, the investors, and also the recipient countries, but in a way that would actually ensure transparency. We don't have transparency around any of these contracts, and that's why we don't learn fast on these issues. But talking about, you know, if you were to repatriate the money, where the money goes? The, with the tax cut in the U.S., there was an estimate today that trillions of dollars would be repatriated to the U.S. And that made me think about 
if we were to do like we do with developing countries and say, we're going to forgive your debt if you invest in the MDGs at the time, right? What if we had said to those companies, repatriate these trillion with a lower tax, now you have to align with the SDGs. You're still going to make money. But that money, you, had, you were offshore, and now you can bring it back. Sure as hell, you should be able to support something good with it. So it seems to me we have a model for developing countries because with the, the, the debt forgiveness, that money was at, at, they had a contract to basically invest that money to further the MDGs, and we could do something very similar for the repatriation of those. But Akin is the expert. You go talk to him afterward. Um, and on the multi-stakeholder, I just want to clarify because what I meant is there, there is so much interest from the private sector. They are doing all that work, and they're out there. You guys are all doing it, but we, we don't really have a way to bring you in to, and, and scale that up and give it the, the aura of the UN in a way that doesn't affect our brand. How do we do the due diligence? Which multi-stakeholder partnership is actually good that we can give the aura of the UN without sacrificing? And Global Compact is trying to work on that, but we're not there yet. So any, any, anything that you guys can help us do that, I think would go a long way. Chantal, if, if I may, because it was mentioned earlier, and it's always overlooked, small, medium-sized enterprises. I mean, if you take the tiny little firms around, if you take, I, you're from Nigeria, right? Yes, please. You take the millions of little businesses in Nigeria, their day-to-day -day impact on Nigeria is incredible. The people they employ, the cash they generate, the, you know, and there is no systemic way of getting out to SMEs around right. the world. Right. And I can't remember the numbers of it. I mean, there's something like 90% of world employment, 75% of world GDP is produced by these tiny little firms, which also, by the way, in terms of your, they're always vulnerable to, the, to, to police and to higher authority. If you're a great big corporation, you can work things out, right? If you're a little mom and pop shop in a small village somewhere outside of Lagos, my guess is you're pretty vulnerable. So, and, and where in our system are we getting out to the broad mass of the yeah. people? And Jean Pierre always mentioned that. Who, who needs the negotiation of trade investment? We have another question over there. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm a cognitive psychologist. And um, I want to come from the perspective of uh, Steve Young. And this is because in psychology, we, it's a natural law, the law of systems and subsystems. Whatever the system you set in place, the natural law of systems always apply. And that's the feedback loop he mentioned recently, just a few, uh, few minutes ago. Um, I want to agree with him that there's a serious influence on the issue of ethics. The nature of man and the aggregate status of communities influence the GDP or the productive capacity of the citizens. If there is no ethical system, leaders could easily exploit the followers or the subordinates. It is the average level of the, 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 the intellectuals or the leaders, positive influence or negative influence, that determine the general outcome at the end of each year. Hence, attitude, pride, determine every performance in every community. In fact, that relates to the human nature of, in education, we, talk, we, we call domains, the affective domain, cognitive domain, and um, uh, psychomotor. After academic world, individuals are faced with need for career and skills. Despite what they are educated in, if the psychological status of individuals are not positive, it is difficult to deliver. You can agree with me that entrepreneurs who have no desire to satisfy their clients may inadvertently uh, deceive or may not succeed in their growth. We could also recall when he mentioned about that it is the greater percentage of wealthy families, wealthy people, has higher potentials in caring for the uh, society because most entrepreneurs hold the first law of satisfaction of human wants in order to get more clients to buy more of his products. However, the regional challenges militate against certain issues in some locations, and that is why the difficulties vary. You can remember when the farmer here 
was mentioning the issues of cocoa in sub-Saharan Africa. There was a research conducted at Bayero University in Nigeria that spanned seven years. The theme was climatic and environmental factors affecting learning and performance, an international survey. 91 countries were involved. Specifically, it indicated that climatic and environmental circumstances in each community influenced the health outcome, which in other words, influenced the mental or attitudinal outcome. Hence, did attitudinal outcome and pride determine management issues, skills, performance, managerial ability? So some locations, some countries have difficulty in managing their economy. Some are disposed to natural drive of selfishness, self-interest first. If for 23 years the money looted from a country could be higher than the money the country has traded in business activities for the same 23 years, could you imagine what that's all about? These are funds that could transform the, uh, the economic development and infrastructural development of that country times by five. So what we're saying is that when I hear uh, Chantal talk, Carpenter mentioning about to find a way, the ways that could be successful in the developed economies definitely cannot be successful in such economy where the systems and subsystems is so negative, especially coming from the climatic and environmental issues. The climate is so weak. Yes, it, so, it seems comfortable, but the climate is not conducive for enzymes that design the human factor. And what are, where do they play this role? In our women. The women in South Africa is faced with heavy level of disease burden. They're faced with plasmodium. These infections and disease burden affect their capacity have newborn that are smart, able to focus positively, able to desire to satisfy human wants, whether they are leaders or entrepreneurs. It is also challenging that the number of women who die in mortality rate is so many. In every two minutes a pregnant woman dies, that is 136 times more than that of developed economies. Hence, most children or most people growing in academic world education issues, health issues in developing countries have serious issues. Even when they are taught what is taught in developed economy, they can't cope with it. Yes, they've learned them, they have the certificates, but as leaders, it may not give them the psychological way without in the negotiation factor. Yes, in negotiation, it takes two parties, the law of availability and unavailability. Availability. During negotiations, you say your own need you express your desire based on your scale. The one who is negotiating with you may not stand on your own side because that's negotiation. That's the law of homostatics, available and unavailable, systems and subsystems. These are the searching for equilibrium. We cannot change this, no matter what the law is. The law is what the one we see, but the natural energy system drive the psychological composition to deliver, negotiate, and then present your case appropriately. If it is not done, the feedback mechanism provides failures and, and so on. It's not just that the UN want to support, provide funds. If that fund is repatriated back, there's all likelihood that it's going to go back to another country. So most developed economies, we wish to keep these funds and use it through other approaches for the sake of the least, most vulnerable in the sub saharan Africa. So I want to implore you to see that there is, what we can do is to support maternal skill that could have our newborn born with high psychological status so they can grow to cope with the competitive market in the international world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you, like to ask uh, uh, you would like to ask another question? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'm really, really sorry for taking the floor again. Uh, I think I'll, I just want to ask a question from my brother here, um, being a psychologist, right? That we know that uh, all that he has said, uh, it, it, it's, it's correct, but there is a link that is missing, which is the inequality that we 
talking about here. The Englishman says it takes two to tango. And the rule should be should apply that cross. What will I've seen concern illicit financial flow is that it is not just about a group of people that want to be wasteful, but rather it is an unsuspecting community versus a deceptive agenda. Our, the last speaker over there said something about Raymond Baker. In 1961, Raymond Baker arrived in Lagos for business. And while he was there, he was speaking to uh, a business community there that came from abroad that, how do they make profit here? And they said, no, we, we're just doing this for free and all that. But when you look into their book, they have built all kinds of excessive profit into the cost of the items. And so the community is just purchasing because they had no alternative. And this money is being siphoned abroad. Now, if you say that to return an asset will go to wrong hand, this is the same argument that we hear from communities that are holding the asset of one developing country. That's an unfair statement. If you allow someone to take illicit financial flow into your economy, you are guilty, just like where the money was taken from. And so what we are asking, the question is, it has to be balanced. Let the same judgment, the same treatment that we are giving to those who are mismanaging the economy or who are allowing this illicit financial flow and those who are perpetuating it. Because if you get to bank in the United States and I run banking here with $5,000, you are likely to be asked at the counter, where did you get this money? But if you are transferring 500 million, nobody asks you any question. Yes. There was a story of, 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 of a business, of a man who went to bank manager and said, um, I learned that uh, so 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 person has so so amount of money here. And he brought out gun, peace to, and said, Now tell me how much does he have? What is this? And I'm going to shoot you now. And he said, I can't tell you anything. He has no money here. And I'm going to shoot you now. And he said, Shoot. And eventually the man said, ah, okay, I now know that you're a good man to do business with. I also brought some money, and which means you can keep my secret. Let us understand what goes on in the business community. There is a lot of bleeding in developing country. Let us stop it. Let's help these people. The question that I wanted to answer is, what can we do tomorrow? We can build capacity. We can help these people build capacity. That's one. Shanta has spoken about contract drafting. I, I don't want to be mentioning of countries that they've had to sell off their company, their industry, to a foreign consortium who bought it at Pitan. And within one year, they've made more than... Why wouldn't it happen? You got the technology. You have everything. And you knew what you can make from this, but you deceive people buy at very little amount, and then you say, oh, it's, you know, you, you, it's business. No, no, that's not business. That's wickedness. So let's face the reality. If we want to run an international system that want to help each other, that do not want to leave anybody behind, then it cannot be business as usual. And then we must, by all means, ensure that any illegal and illicit fund in our banking system has to be returned to the owner. Now we are, we are glad that we have been able to overcome the secret code. You know how long we suffer from secret code? People steal money from Africa and other places, dump it somewhere else, and they die in the process. Nobody knows which money is where and who owes what because they have code. The, money, the name is not even there. Why should an economy allow a secret code to be run and then go out and, and claim that some people are not developing. So let's, I think this thing is beyond a day discussion like this. Let's take it gradually. We have a problem. That is one. We are not running from that. The report of the high level on illicit financial flow so, shows it very clearly. Africa has a problem. The international community has also taken the decision to fight impunity. 
Therefore, let us help this system. Let us not keep going back and say you are responsible for your own. Yeah. We are responsible for it, but we know that you are also guilty. And if you are guilty, then we, we both need to repent. I think, Chair, I thank you so much. <laughs> okay. I noticed I was going to say earlier, but awkward, but at this point, in, in all these discussions I go around the SDGs and things like that, there's discussion of the private sector and the private sector stepping up and financing and the obligations of the private sector. What is overlooked, I think, in these discussions is, is not just a technical point among economists, but a profound moral and political point which needs to be surfaced, which Jean-Pierre actually indicated without talking about it, there's a distinction between business and wickedness. And wickedness is rent extraction. Most of what, what passes for business and capitalism in the world today is rent seeking and rent extraction. And everywhere you get rent seeking and, rec and rent extraction, you get bad people, you get exploitation of poor people, you get disincentives, the system doesn't work. So maybe in the SDG world, you guys ought to sort of start breaking it apart, sort of within the private sector, the good guys and the bad guys, yeah. right? I mean, if you're a good, a fine, to get a definition, I mean, we work co around here. We sort of, if you do your business this way, fantastic. You're great. You're helping your customers. You're creating jobs. You're, you're not cheating. You're not doing this. But if you either, now you got if you're part of an elite here and you are using political systems and power to extract rent, uh, then no, no, that's, we have to do something about that. The problem that I worry about are the poor, the poor business people, mostly middle class and lower, who, who are trapped in a power structure. Somebody comes around and says, you want an export license? You know, you, you, want your, you want your son or daughter to go, to go to college somewhere, that's fine, but this and that, or, oh, I see your son and daughter is already studying in Canada with Tony, you want to transfer 10,000 US over there, we can, I can arrange that for you. And what do they do? You have to go along, right? Mm -hmm. But I think if at your level, and in looking at these issues that you're raising, your social capital, social responsibility, making distinctions within the private sector, between, between honest, reputable, sort of law-abiding, ethically motivated people and, and other systems of rent extraction might create awareness con conversations and then, and then actions. Uh, our panelists and discussion to make a conclusion, was that uh, your conclusion? Okay, just a few minutes conclusion, uh, you know, uh, of the topic, uh, on the topic of the day. Thank you. Sorry, um, just to go back on what you're saying, we really need that because every time, everywhere, I used to work a lot with civil society, so they tend to put all the business into one basket. They either hate them or they think there's a solution. But business is so, first you have the small and medium enterprise, you have to distinguish between the TNCs. And then you have the investors that you have to distinguish the financial sector, you have to distinguish from the business, the, those that produce the things. The OECD just came out of a report that shows that the financialization of the economy actually at the beginning creates some growth and then it decreases the growth. It doesn't create anything good for anybody. And so, and we're totally going towards that. So I think what you're saying, of course the UN can't do that, right? Uh, we can't see with the good companies and the bad companies. I, I mean, there's the principle, they sign them, they don't sign them, but it doesn't mean that they're good or bad. And I think it starts with, you know, CSR in my mind is dead. We're past CSR. It's the way the company operates. It's, it's according to their materiality and what they, if they're producing, if, if they're producing well what they're producing, are they, are they also trying to reach and provide a service or a good that is affordable? And, and, and available for the poorest of the, of the communities? Are they meeting the services that are not met right now? And I really think that, you know, in Daniela, in your, your the, the, the Commission on so Social Status, I think it's really where these discussions need to be discussed, I think. Angus? Oh, oh Daniela, would you like to... Uh, Commission on Social
to respond to a few points. I mean, I think you're right, Chantel, that it's not the UN's role to sort of label businesses as good businesses or bad businesses. But the, the, the point of the 10 principles of the Global Compact um, and the corresponding sort of ref reporting and accountability frameworks that come along with that is to give civil society and governments and investors, um, you know, a, a framework to assess really that, you know, whether a business is a responsible business. And, you know, with the SDGs, we've really transformed our approach uh, and are trying to encourage that kind of radical transparency that will enable, you know, an honest assessment by other stakeholders of whether a company is, you know, really sincerely um, committed to doing business responsibly. So I think that's, that's an important um, development. And the Secretary General recently acknowledged that that's something that needs to be really at the core of the way the UN is choosing its business partners, is making sure that they accept those principles. So we can provide that framework of accountability, and then we rely on collaboration with other stakeholders to really hold companies to account for that. Thank you. Daisy? extremely important and I think we are just entering a new arena that is not being really discussed and uh, when we talk about poverty we overlook uh, actually what governments they have the responsibilities what the private sector have the have responsibility and actually the ones producing and consuming the goods and service have the responsibilities so i think uh, uh, it's a very uh, enthusiastic start uh, i think daniela really it's something that we could really discuss a little bit more and uh, putting the bad and the goods and the ones that uh, are recipient of these bads and goods to put in the table to discuss as well. But it's really a starting of uh, making business not as usual. And maybe we can really get one step more in advancing to combat and or to eradicate poverty, to build social capital and social responsibility. Thank you, Jesse. Tony? Well, I'm an eternal optimist, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I still go with the golden principle of be the change you want to see. And I think if all stakeholder, uh, uh, you know, your critical mass, if there's a committed group of people towards that, and it begins by asking intelligent questions, and those questions are, where are we now? Where do we want to be in the future? How do we get there? And of course, we were speaking last night, uh, what are the metrics? Let's make sure we have clear metrics to measure that. Because we all know, I think today we've heard, in the room here and some for another, that the key hindrance to CSR uh, you know, is generally on a favorable image of business. That's one aspect. The other aspect is, you know, sentiments in the labor force, uh, whether they're positive about their employer or, or, or about their opportunities. Um, you know, unfavorable, this unfavorable image of regulators, of government, lack of trust in the people you, so that's supposed to bring order and mediation. So I think uh, both the public sector and the private sector both should uh, be held to a, 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 a self-determined standard, but one that will move the needle forward. So I think uh, the system is getting better, and, and, and dissemination of information is, is the first key. Uh, finally, uh, Dan Daniela's concept uh, with ECOSOC for e education leads to confidence, and confidence is what gives empowerment. And empowerment is the individual's or collective ability to say, we can control our destiny, and you could do good, right? Um, you could do well by doing good. That's it. Thank you. Let me turn to my right. Um, uh, Professor Baldwick would like to make a conclusion. Speak about uh, uh, ethics. Uh, principles, then we have to define a list of principles. And I, I know it's each decision will be a very, uh, it's a decision where, where you have to balance how many of these principles you can realize. 
but the main problem is not to ask other principles. And in this case, I think we have to, to discuss about a lot of questions, how to make it better, to organize the process the, and the principles. And then there are a lot of difficult questions. And one is transparency. Can we see what happened during a process? Or there are some hidden decisions we don't know, but they are uh, fallen. And the other is corruption, because that is what I said before. It's a cancer of each society. And that is just also a stopping of a progress uh, develop development. And the last is, how can we get, uh, uh, organize a process when, where we can get a lot of actors in a participation to get results, which is very close to the developments inside the societies. And then the last one is, I, I believe we can, we can organize such a press only on one way. We have to, uh, to, uh, to take an open discourse about what we want in future. That is just my small <laughs> uh, result of our discussion. But I think I'm, I'm also a, a Tony optimist uh, because I think we can create a other kind of connecting uh, a global sustainable world if we do it in an open discussion. Thank you, Mr. Stefano, would you like, like to make a, a, a final comment? Just a Thank few you. Words. Uh, coming from the private sector, I mentioned you before the consumer. I think if we want really to reach something tangible by the end of the day, we have to reach all the citizens. That's very important. I think we focus a lot on, on different issues, more on a very high level, which I think very important. But I think at the end of the day, we are all citizens. So we have to sit all together, and I think we have to bring this message, we as private sector, to our consumer. Uh, I as father to my daughter, and I think all of us to all of us. That's very important because otherwise I think it will, the risk, it, it remain a niche. And it remain at a certain level without getting the contamination that the SDGs should have everywhere. Thank you, Stefano. Comment? Please. Go back to one of the points that was raised about short-termism and say that we've got to be in here for the long haul. The solutions are not going to be found in the immediate term and we've really got to focus in that long-term solution and figuring out where we need to put and make those long-term investments. If I have to bring together discussions that we have on SDGs, that we have on the four or five famines, whatever, uh, agency you want to believe, uh, the recent humanitarian outlook about 135 million people going to need aid from the UN, that to me puts it in one basket and that's a need for us to focus on long-term institutions. If you look at the report that was released I believe two weeks ago looking at the future of trade, it all points to long-term institutions. If you look at the questions that the distinguished and the points that the distinguished delegate uh, from Nigeria raised, I draw back and we don't have anyone from uh, the mission of Mongolia here, but if you look at the case of Mongolia, a country that had to come up with ways of dealing with precisely equitable sustainable development, because I think, sir, you pointed on the equitable part of it that we very often tend to forget in these discussions. The way to do this is when you're able to bring strong institutions, strong institutions that are transparent, institutions that look at the transparency and anti-corruption across the system, and institutions that also promote empowerment, in the case of my agency, legal empowerment, particularly of the poor, is of great importance. But those uh, building blocks of society, and those, unfortunately, you can't really build when you're already talking about um, post-conflict, because you need to have started building them before. And those are exactly the, the institutions that you go to when you have those questions. You know, it's the chambers of commerce, it's the courts that arbitrate, it's the institutions that ensure that the system is respected. Thank you, Judith. Uh, thank you. Um, Okay, well, the, 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 
the theme was building private sector trust and resilient society to eradicate poverty. I think I, I want to focus on this. And uh, I want to focus on this in uh, regard of my position as uh, talking about the financial sector. Uh, if we want reform, the first thing we need is money, however we do it. And if we have a financial system that is now over 60 years old, we had the last financial crisis in 2008. Usually financial crises are recurring every seven years. And we look at the last financial crisis where we knew that the problem were not the subprimes but were the debt. And at that point, the debt to GDP was one to one. Today, thank you to our magicians at the central banks, the ratio of debt to GDP is one to four. We have not done any progress in eliminating what Steve called the rent seekers, no. They got stronger. And as long as this financial system keeps operating the way it does, it will be very difficult to find the necessary fund that Your Excellency mentioned that are a necessity to move forward to implement the SDG. But I don't want to end this on a negative note. I think uh, there are possibilities, but there we need a political will to go ahead, and we need a political will to fix the financial system that nowadays is just feeding a very, very few people at the expense of the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Your turn. <laughs> Thank you. So, with the political will, I can say uh, yes. There is. It should be a political will. It should be like a good governance for any country to provide uh, to eradicate the poverty, starting for from the good governance and the good leadership. For example, uh, actually, uh, the I mean the leadership that can predict the future. They can predict everything. For example, my country in, by 2050. There is like the last shipment of oil from my country by 2050. So my country from since 2000, since the year of 2000, they are doing strategies to how to predict, bring uh, how to predict, to predict the future, mm -hmm. how we can work, set strategies so for our future generation because now we are living in welfare society. So after 50 years, how it comes for our future generations? Mm -hmm. how, will they go to back to the poverty again? No. That's why we set something called uh, the knowledge. Uh, I mean the knowledge uh, economy, economy of knowledge, or something like. Yeah, knowledge uh, economy, yes. So by no knowledge okay, uh, economy, we're bringing the best universities here. And we invest a lot on the culture and the arts and a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So my country now, you can see the tourism, the, uh, the yeah. arts, and a lot of things by opening even the Louvre, uh, the Louvre Museum like uh, two months ago in my country. It's uh, like between a partnership between two countries. Yeah, but again, we, um, our, my government is predict the future and bringing, you know, uh, the private sector. How are we bringing the FDIs to my country? It's like uh, harsh conditions. It's uh, we are living in very uh, unstable uh, environment. Like it's a Middle East, uh, a lot of political instability and economic instability around us. But we are like beyond this. How we bring them actually? This is here, it comes the rule of laws. For example, we set the rules and the regulations just to empower those private sectors mm -hmm. who are coming all the way from overseas to my country to set these uh, businesses. So we need to make sure that, as you, uh, as you said, uh, sir, that we need to make sure that they are comfortable to do businesses in my, in my country. So how they can put their monies in a place that they are, they cannot, it's a risky place. They should have like kind of insurance, and we give 
them the insurance. That's why, like in my country, more than 20, 200 nationalities and a lot of businesses worldwide in a lot of sectors. And you cannot, like in healthcare, in education, in tours, in anything, anything in your mind. If you have like a money and you have the will to do investment, you can come also. So. You know, the, after the businesses actually they are satisfied from themselves, they start to think about the social responsibility. Mm -hmm. Not even in my society, in local society, their uh, I mean their social responsibility comes to outside, to the region, to Pakistan, to uh, like Asia, to Africa. They are fine with the country. They can do anything in the region, yeah, but beyond this. And we give them all the things. Like two days ago or three days ago, uh, our, uh, the prime minister actually set a role for the social responsibilities, uh, rules and regulation for all the business sectors. So because it will be, the, uh, it regulates their works, regulates uh, even the ambitions, how to do their businesses, uh, how to do their social responsibility. So to include all the six, all the six um, I mean all the, um, all the societies, all the, uh, yeah, all the societies. So it includes the youth, the women, and the people of determination, and also the elder people who sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, or most of the time, are like uh, living on the margin. Mm -hmm. No one care about them, but here in our society, they are caring about them. And on the top of this, the private sector who actually take care of them. So here again, I will tell you something that it's the governments and the good governments who actually uh, do uh, like a huge role in how to implement and empower the private sector to do their businesses and to uh, to implement the SDGs. So usually the governments, the good governments actually try to think about the private sector as a partner and as a, a good partner to do the, uh, to implement the SDGs nationally and internationally and even regionally. Thank you. for your country to move from an energy-based economy to uh, create, you know, knowledge economy and create other um, economic sectors and so on. May I ask uh, Daniela to say the final words, please? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have taken so many notes um, <laughs> because everything is interesting and important. Um, development. Many topics dealt with from uh, different dimensions, all related to the well-being of people and the planet. From my perspective, the social dimension of um, sustainable development, but when I look at the social dimension, I have to see uh, it, uh, I have to see also the other two dimen dimensions through the lenses of the social, but the economy can do that through the lenses of the social and the environmental. The environment through the lenses. So it's integrated. So while I was listening to you all, somebody said global. Somebody said trust. So, so I picked up these words. And then uh, somehow they started connecting together. And the Commission for Social Development. And then governance and policymakers. I do not know if it can work, but couldn't we all think about kind of a global forum on trusting or whatever term you want to use? And every time we will use uh, and we will focus on a different topic. And it could be, for instance, as we have created, my division has created a DSPD slash DESA forum on disability and development. And it takes place before or after the um, conference of the state parties on, their, uh, on the implementation of the con Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, so couldn't we think of a similar forum, but focusing on something else before or after? Maybe before, it depends. The Commission for Social Development, and therefore this forum, depending on the topic it will choose every year, that could be aligned either on the priority theme of the commission or on the, on the priority theme or, or on the theme of ECOSOC. This year is in, in resilience, next year is empowerment. And then align itself 
to what could contribute to, to the high-level political forum, for instance. So there ha must be, be a project here. And, and the Commission for Social Development could be this space or around it, this space to have something a little bit more global uh, and a forum. In a forum, there is the space. That's what the forum is. It's a space to debate. And, and but to bring concrete actions in support of the endeavors of governments that are sitting in the commission and not only for social development and policy makers. Because at the commission, policies are discussed and re resolution recommendations are brought to the table and then resolutions happen during the GA, the General Assembly, a few months later. So by summarizing concrete actions as we were mentioning not long ago, into maybe three, five pages, technical pages, substantive pages, that can really contribute, not narrative only, facts and impact. Um, and with impact, I would like to close this, uh, my, my, my small um, suggestion that I shared with you now. Uh, as you know, the UN is going through a reform. And also the department where I work is going through a reform in the reform. And, uh, and we directors have been asked by the Under Secretary General to think how, depending on our mandates, we would like to strengthen, in my case, in our case, the social dimension of sustainable development within the mandates we're given, because we have to work within the mandates we're given by member states. Um, I, I have this idea of the three I's. It's I like inclusion. It's I like inequalities reduction in parentheses. And the last I is impact, impact. So we could think about that. We have one year ahead of us. And if we want to create partnerships, goal 17, um, my division would be more than happy to, to do that with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. It was really I heard today many um, topics that were really touching. Okay, you would like to ask, ask a question? Go ahead. Ask your question first. It's not a question. It's a comment on successful partnerships. Uh, I am Get Struli, and I'm a representative of African Action on AIDS, and we are in Cameroon. And my um, president, uh, Ruth Engo Pamela, uh, wanted me to say how much she could do with the help of CIFA. They uh, had a very good uh, relationship. She could uh, build a well uh, 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 well, and also infrastructure for water and for sanitation. And she put all that in a newsletter saying how much she appreciates C uh, CIFA. And at the end, she says, keep going, CIFA. <laughs> so I thought I wanted to mention that. Thank you. between CIFA and uh, Africa Action on Aid. Um, the, uh, I was really impressed that you mentioned uh, so many things. So you mentioned uh, trust, uh, cooperation between the public and private uh, sector. You mentioned education, the young people, the rule of law, uh, creating uh, really the, uh, the, the um, uh, through also um, uh, women empowerment, uh, a, a convenient uh, environment for uh, rebuilding trust and, uh, uh, and eradicating uh, uh, poverty. I was really impressed. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Excellencies, for your questions as, as well. It was really excellent. We are running out of time. And it was an, really a, a, um, a rich and uh, inspiring debate. Thank you all. And Melissa, maybe uh, we'll add a few. No? OK. So yeah, we close the, the debate. And thank you all for your participation. It was really excellent.